Track 12. Fresh dhows from the mainland, heavily laden with cargo, came in to moor above the beach. Still the six men on the terrace talked and debated, and the tide reached high slack, then began its ebb. All this time Al-Malik listened, and spoke little, while he allowed each of the others to say what was in their hearts, without check or restraint. Carefully he sifted the gems of wisdom from the dross. They reviewed the order of battle of those forces on which they could rely, and made lists of those sheikhs who were uncommitted or doubtful. They compared these to the powers that Ibn Yaqub commanded. Only when he had heard all they had to say did Al-Malik make his decision. It will depend upon the tribes of the deep desert, the Saar, the Dam, and the Karab. They are the greatest warriors of all the Omani. Without them, our cause cannot prosper. Yet we have not heard from them. We do not know in which direction they will point the war lance. His counsellors murmured agreement, and Al-Malik said softly, I must go to them. They were silent for a while, considering this bold course of action, and then Al-Alama said, Your brother the Caliph will not allow it. If you insist, he will smell danger on the wind. I will make the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, taking the ancient desert route to the holy places, the road that passes through the territory of the tribes. The Caliph cannot forbid a pilgrim under penalty of eternal damnation. There is great risk, Al-Alama said. There is never great gain without great risk, Al-Malik replied. And God is great. Allah Akbar, they replied. Surely God is great. Al-Malik made a graceful gesture of dismissal, and one by one they came to embrace him, kiss his hand, and take their leave. Al-Alama was the last, and Al-Malik said, Stay with me. It is the hour of Mahrib, the prayers at the setting of the sun. We will pray together. Two slave girls brought pitchers of pure sweet well water, and the two men performed the ritual purification washing their hands in the water that the girls poured for them from the silver pitchers, rinsing their mouths three times, snuffing water cupped in the right palm three times, and blowing it out of the nostrils with the fingers of the left hand, then going on to bathe their faces, arms and feet. The slave girls left, and Al-Alama stood and faced the Kaaba in Mecca, thousands of miles to the north. Cupping his hands behind his ears, he began the call to prayer in a loud voice, our God is great. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Come to prayer. Come to your own good. Below them in the courtyard and under the palm trees along the head of the beach, hundreds of robed figures assembled quietly and took up the posture of reverence, all facing in the same direction. The prayer has begun, chanted Al-Alama. When it was ended, Al-Malik gestured for the mullah to take a seat on the cushion close to his right hand. I saw the boy, Al-Amkhara, on the beach when I arrived. Tell me, how has he fared in my absence? He grows like a tamarind tree, strong and tall. Already he is a fine horseman. He has a quick mind and a ready tongue, sometimes too ready. He is often prone to lack respect for his elders and betters. He does not take readily to criticism or restraint, and when he is angry or thwarted, his choice of invective would make a sea captain pale, Al-Alama said primly. Al-Malik hid his smile behind the rim of his coffee cup. What he heard only made him like his infidel son the more. He would make a leader of men. Al-Alama went on. He has come to manhood and been properly circumcised by Ben Abram. When the time comes for him to accept Islam, he will be ready. That is good, the prince said. And tell me, Holy Father, have your teachings borne fruit in that direction? He now speaks our language as though born to it, and he can recite long sections of the Holy Quran from memory. Al-Alama looked uneasy and evasive. Has he made any progress towards submitting himself to God? Al-Malik insisted. Without that, the prophecy can have no effect. The Prophet himself has said that no man can be forced to convert to Islam. He must come to it in his own way and in his own time. So your answer is no. He glories in argument, 
Sometimes I think the only reason he memorizes the Quran is the better to argue with me. He glories in the religion of his own people and boasts that one day he will be inducted into some Christian religious order, which he calls the Knights of the Order of St. George and the Holy Grail, like his grandfather and his father before him. It is not for us to question the ways of Allah, al-Malik said. God is great, al alama endorsed his assertion. But there is more to tell concerning the boy. We have had an inquiry from the English consul in Zanzibar concerning him. Al-Malik leaned forward earnestly. I thought that the consul in Zanzibar had been murdered over a year ago. That was the man named Gray. Since his death, the English have sent another to take his place. I see. What form did this inquiry from the new man take? He describes the boy accurately, his age and colouring. He knows that Al-Amkhara was captured by Al-Awuf, and that he was sold into slavery. He knows that he was bought by Your Excellency. He knows the name that we have given him, Al-Amkhara. How has he learned all this? Worry lines creased Al-Malik's brow. I do not know, except that Ben Abraham has told me much about the boy's lineage. He met and spoke to Al-Amhara's elder brother when the Franks captured him at Al-Auf's base. The prince nodded. What does the doctor know concerning the boy? His family is noble, close to the English king. Despite his youth, Al-Amhara's brother is a formidable fighting mariner, and he has sworn a mighty oath to find and rescue his younger brother. Perhaps it is this family who is behind these inquiries from Zanzibar. We do not know this for certain, but it would be wise not to ignore these questions. Al-Malik pondered this, then asked, The English are buyers and owners of slaves. How can they object to the same practice in others? What can they do to force us to their will? Their land is far away, at the end of the earth. They cannot send an army against us. Ben Abram says that the Franks have perfidious ways of making war. They issue firman to the captains of their armed merchant ships against their enemies. These men are like sharks or barracudas. They come for plunder. Would the English king declare war on us over one child? Ben Abram fears that he might, not only for the sake of the child, but also for the excuse to send their ships into our waters, to seize the territory and the riches of the Omani. I will think on all you have told me, Al-Malik dismissed him. Bring Ben Abraham and the boy to me here tomorrow after the Zor prayers. Dorian came to his audience with the prince, consumed by both trepidation and excitement at the prospect. When he had first met the prince, Dorian had been possessed of no such qualms. Al-Malik had been only another Muslim, an enemy and a pagan chief. However, he had learned much since he had been under the instruction of al alama and Ben Abram. He now knew that the prince's claim to royalty stretched back as far as that of the English king. He knew of his exploits as a sailor and a warrior, of the reverence his subjects felt towards him. In addition to this, the spiritual umbilical cord that bound Dorian to England and Christianity was unravelling and eroding with time and great distance. These days he never had an opportunity to speak his own language. He thought in Arabic, and had difficulty recalling the English words for even the simplest ideas. Even his memories of his family were fading. He thought of his brother Tom only on occasion, and all ideas of escape from Lamu had been abandoned. He no longer thought of his state here on the island as one of captivity. Slowly he was being absorbed into the Arab world and the Arab way of thought, now confronted with the prince again, he was overcome with awe and reverence. When he knelt before Al-Malik on the coral stones of the terrace and asked for his blessing, his heart ran faster with surprise and pleasure at the form in which the prince returned his greeting. Come and sit beside me, my son. We have much to discuss. This regal and impressive man had reaffirmed him as his son in front of these witnesses. Dorian felt proud, then experienced a sharp pang of guilt. He had a fleeting image of his true father, but the picture in his mind of Hal's face was blurry. I will always be true to my real father, he promised himself staunchly, but he obeyed Al-Malik's invitation promptly and gladly. 
In my absence you have become a man. Al Malik studied him keenly. Yes, my lord, Dorian replied, and had to stop himself adding automatically, by the grace of Allah. I can see that this is so. Al Malik picked out the outline of firm young muscle and breadth of shoulders beneath the kanzu that Dorian wore so naturally. And it is therefore fitting that you should relinquish the name of the child and take in its stead the name of the man. From henceforth you shall be called al Sali. It is the will of Allah, Al-Alama and Ben Abram said together. They both looked proud and pleased with this honour that the prince had accorded their protégé. It redounded to their credit, for the name the prince had chosen was a propitious one. It meant the drawn sword. Your beneficence is like the rising of the sun after the dark night, Dorian replied, and Al-Alama nodded his approval at the choice of words and their inflection. It is also fitting that you should have your own lance-bearer. Al-Malik clapped his hands, and a young man stepped out onto the terrace with a long, raking stride like that of a racing camel. He was probably fifteen years older than Dorian, in his late twenties, and a warrior by his dress and mien. He wore a curved scimitar at his waist and carried a round bronze shield on his shoulder. This is Batula, the prince told him. He will make his oath to you. Batula came to Dorian and knelt in front of him. From this day forward you are my liege lord, he said in a strong, clear voice. Your enemies are my enemies. Wherever you may ride, I shall carry your lance and your shield at your right hand. Dorian put his hand upon Batula's shoulder in acceptance of the pledge, and Batula rose to his feet. The two young men looked each other in the face, and instinctively Dorian liked what he saw there. Batula was not handsome of features, but his face was broad and honest, his nose large and hawkish. When he smiled, his teeth were even and white. He wore his thick, dark hair oiled with ghee and twisted into a braid over one wide shoulder. Batula is an exponent of the lance, Al-Malik said, and a warrior tried in battle. There is much he has to teach you, Al-Salim. The lance was the weapon of the true Arab horseman. Dorian had watched the novices at practice on the field of arms, and had thrilled to the charge of pounding hoofs, the steely flash of the lance points as they picked a suspended brass finger ring out of the air at full charge. I shall be a willing pupil, Dorian promised. Al-Malik dismissed Batula. When he had left the terrace, the prince resumed. Very soon I shall undertake another long journey to the north, the pilgrimage to Mecca, through the sands and the wilderness of the deserts. You will accompany me, my son. My heart rejoices that you choose me, great lord. Al-Malik made the gesture of dismissal, and when Dorian had gone, he turned back to Al-Alama and ben Abraham. You will send a message to the Sultan in Zanzibar for him to pass on to the English consul there. He paused to collect the words, then went on. Tell him that Prince al-Malik indeed purchased al-Amkhara from al -Auf. He did this to take the boy under his protection and to shield him from harm. Tell him that despite all al-Malik could do to protect him, al-Amkhara fell sick of a pestilence and that he died a year ago. He is buried here on the island of Lambu. Tell him that Al-Malik has spoken thus. Al-Alama bowed. It shall be as you command, Your Excellency. He was impressed by this ingenious solution. Al-Amkhara is dead, Al-Malik went on. You will erect a headstone in the cemetery with that name on it. Al-Amkhara is dead. Al-Salil lives on. By God's grace, Al-Alama acknowledged the order. I shall take the boy with me into the desert, and leave him with the Tsar to hide him. There, in the sands, he will learn the warrior's way. In time, the Franks will forget that he once existed. This is a wise decision. Al-Salil is more than a son to me. He is my living talisman. I shall never yield him to the demands of the Franks, he said softly, but firmly. The swallow came up the channel, then tacked into the roads of Zanzibar. Ahead there were ten sail of square-rigged ships lying in the anchorage, besides a mass of Arab dows. Tom Courtney looked them over carefully. 
They flew the flags of some of the great trading nations of the Northern Hemisphere with a preponderance of Portuguese and Spaniards. Not a Frenchy in sight, Mr. Tyler, Tom announced with relief. He did not relish the complications of sharing a neutral port with ships of the enemy. No, agreed Ned, but there is at least one East Indiaman. He pointed out the tall ship, a princess of the ocean, displaying the majesty of the company. They will offer us an even frostier welcome than the Frenchies would have done. Tom grinned recklessly. I give not a fig for them, he said. They can do nothing to us outside the courts of England, and we will not be back there for a while. He added under his breath, not until they drag me there in chains. He glanced up at his own masthead, devoid of any flag. He had not wanted to announce his nationality. As soon as we anchor, I will go ashore and pay a visit to the new consul, he told Ned. He had spoken to the captain of another English ship in Table Bay when they broke their long voyage at Good Hope. The captain had told him that Gray had a successor in the consular office in Zanzibar. He's some young fellow sent from Bombay after Gray was murdered to take over the consular duties for the Fever Coast and, of course, more importantly, to see to the interest of John Company in those areas. What's his name? Tom had wanted to know. I don't recall. I've never met him. But by all accounts, he is surly and difficult, enchanted by his own importance. Tom watched as Ned took the swallow into the bay and they dropped the anchor in water so clear they could see the multicoloured fish swarming over the coral heads four fathoms under the keel. I will take Aberley ashore with me, Tom said, as soon as the longboat was launched. The two landed on the stone jetty beneath the walls of the old Portuguese fort and made their way into the narrow streets. The heat and the stinking bustle were all so familiar that Tom could hardly credit that it was almost two years since last he had come ashore here. They asked for directions from the Arab harbour master. No, no, he told them. The new consulate is no longer an effendi, Gray's old house in the town. I will send a boy to show you the way. And he picked out one of the ragged urchins from the swarm who were pestering the Ferengi for arms. This son of Shaitan will guide you. Do not give him bakshish of more than one anna. The boy danced ahead leading them out of the jumble of narrow alleys and ramshackle buildings into the palm groves. Along a sandy road, a mile or more beyond the last hovel, they came to a large villa behind high walls. Although the house seemed old, the outer wall had been repaired recently and painted with burnt lime wash. The roof of the main house that showed above the top of the wall was freshly thatched with palm fronds. There were two brass plaques on the gate. One was engraved, His Majesty's Consulate. Below that was the company's emblem of rampant lions and the legend, Office of the United Company of Merchants of England Trading to the East Indies. A servant answered Tom's ring at the outer gates in the wall, and Tom sent him with a note to his master. After a few minutes, the man returned. Tom left Aberley to wait for him in the courtyard and followed him. The main house was laid out around gardens and fountains in the Oriental style of architecture. The ceilings were high, but the rooms sparsely furnished. There were, however, vases of tropical flowers in the rooms through which the servant led Tom, and these floral decorations and the arrangement of cushions on the austere hardwood furniture suggested a feminine hand. At last the servant led Tom into a large room with stone floors and bookcases lining the walls. Please to wait here, if any. The master will come soon. Left to himself, Tom looked up at the slowly revolving fan, and the arrangement of lines and pulleys that led through a hole in the wall to where a slave pulled rhythmically on a line to keep the fan turning. Tom walked to the writing desk in the centre of the floor and glanced at the quill stand and ink pot set out precisely, and at the piles of documents bound with red ribbon and stacked with military precision. Then he turned from the desk and wandered along the bookshelves, trying to divine from their contents the character of the man he had come to meet. The shelves were filled with heavy ledgers, and bound reports with the company emblem embossed on the spine. There was nothing of a personal nature on display, and the room had a soulless feel to it. He was alerted by a footstep on the flags on the terrace outside the entrance to the inner courtyard, and he turned just as a tall, lean figure appeared in the doorway. The bright tropical sun was behind him, so Tom did not recognise him at once. The consul stopped and let his eyes adjust to the gloom of the room after the brilliant sunshine outside. He was dressed in a sober black serge costume with a white lace collar. 
Then he stepped into the room and removed the wide-brimmed black hat from his head. Tom saw his face clearly for the first time. For a long moment his astonishment was so intense that he could neither move nor speak. Then he laughed and started forward. Guy! Is it really you? Impulsively he opened his arms to embrace his twin brother. It was obvious that Guy Courtney's surprise was as great as Tom's. A host of differing emotions showed briefly on his face, then were gone. His features became cold and stiff, and he stepped back from Tom's embrace. Thomas, he said, I had no idea that it was you. You signed a false name on your note. Neither had I any idea that it was you, Tom said, and let his welcoming arms fall to his sides. He avoided the accusation of using a false name. He had deemed it wise not to use his real name here in case by some strange chance a warrant for the murder of William had reached Zanzibar ahead of him. He watched Guy's expression for some sign that this had happened and judged that he could not rely on his twin to shelter him from justice. They stared at each other in silence for a minute, which seemed to Tom like all eternity. Then Guy held out his right hand. With relief, Tom took it. Guy's grip was limp and his flesh as cool as his expression. He dropped Tom's hand after only a brief contact, then turned away to his desk. Please be seated, Thomas. He indicated the high back chair across the room without looking directly at his brother. I trust that you have not returned to these waters to indulge in any form of trade. The fact that you use an assumed name makes me think that that may be the case. When Tom did not reply at once, he went on. I must warn you that my first loyalty is to the company. He made it sound as though he was invoking the name of God, and I will immediately send a report to London. Tom stared at him, feeling his anger boil up swiftly. Merciful heavens, Guy, is that your first concern? Are we not brothers? Do you not want to know about Father and Dorian? I am already aware of Father's death. The company ship that lies in the harbour this day brought me a letter from Lord Childs and from our brother William in England, Guy replied. Tom felt a surge of relief at this confirmation that he had not yet heard of William's death. Guy replaced the quill in its holder and went on. I have mourned father's passing in my own way, so there is nothing more to say on that score, his mouth hardened. Besides, you were always his favourite. I meant little to him. That is not true, Guy. Father loved us all equally, Tom burst out. So you say, Guy shrugged. As for Dorian, I heard that he was lost at sea, drowned and dead. No, he was not. Tom made no effort to keep his voice down. He was captured by the Mussulmen and sold into slavery. Guy laughed without humour. <laughs> you are always one for a wild tale. I assure you, as His Majesty's Consul in these territories, I have access to the most reliable sources of information. Despite his denial, Tom thought he detected a shiftiness in his expression. I was there, damn you, Guy. I saw it with my own eyes. Guy seated himself behind the desk and fiddled with the quill, stroking his own cheek with the plume. Ah, you actually saw him sold into slavery. How surprising that you did nothing to prevent it. No, you puffed-up jackanapes, Tom bellowed. I know that he was in the power of the Muslim pirates, captured and not dead or drowned. I also know for certain that he was sold into slavery. What proof do you... Guy started, but Tom strode to the desk and slammed his hands on the top so that ink spurted up and splattered the piles of documents. The testimony of the Arabs we captured at Flor de Lamar, and proof of my own eyes and senses. Dorian is alive, I tell you, and it is your duty as a brother and an Englishman to help me find him. Guy leapt to his feet. His face was icy pale, his eyes blazing. How dare you come here, into my house, into my territory, in your old overweening, blustering style, and dictate to me what I must do? He screamed at Tom, drops of spittle flying from his lips. Sweet Christ, Guy, don't tempt me further. I'll whip the hide off your craven back if you don't do your duty by our little brother. Those days are long past, Thomas Courtney. I am the master here, the chosen representative of His Majesty of the Company. You will find yourself thrown into prison, your fine ship seized and confiscated, if you raise a hand to me. He was shaking with rage. Don't you dare preach to me, not after what you did to Caroline. His voice rose to a shriek at her name. 
and Tom recoiled as though struck in the chest by a musket ball. At the same time, Guy stepped back, clearly appalled by what he had allowed to slip past his tongue in anger. Tom was cast into confusion by the accusation, which had struck home. They stared at each other speechlessly, and in the silence a small sound made them both turn to the door that led in from the garden. A woman stood there. She was dressed in a pale green dress of Chinese silk with slashed sleeves and high neck. Her full skirts covered her ankles, and only the toes of her slippers showed. She was staring at Tom, as though at her own ghost. One hand clutched her throat, the other held the hand of the child who toddled beside her. "'What are you doing here, Caroline?' Guy roared. "'You know well that you may not come here when I have visitors.' "'I heard voices,' Caroline faltered. "'Her hair was piled high in curls upon her head, "'and ringlets hung down on her cheeks, "'but Tom saw that she was sallow of countenance, "'as though she had recently risen from a sickbed. "'I heard my name called out. "'She was still staring at Tom. "'The child was in smock and ribbons. "'His head was covered with blonde curls, "'and Tom had the impression of an angelic little face "'and perfect pink lips. "'Who's that man?' said the infant, and pointed at Tom with a chuckle. "'Take Christopher out of here!' Guy shouted at Caroline. "'Immediately!' Caroline seemed not to have heard him. "'Tom,' she said in a wondering, bemused tone, "'I never thought to see you again.' Christopher hung on her hand and tried to take an unsteady step towards him, but she pulled him back gently. "'How are you, Tom?' "'In good health,' Tom replied awkwardly. "'as I trust you are.' "'I have been ill,' Caroline whispered, staring at him. "'She moistened her lips. "'Since the birth of our—' "'She paused, blushing and thrown into confusion. "'The birth of Christopher. "'I am sorry.' "'A shadow of regret passed over Tom's face. "'Your family, how are your parents and your sisters?' "'He had to think of their names. Uh, "'Agnes and Sarah?' My father was appointed governor of Bombay. He arranged the post of consul here in Zanzibar for Guy. She glanced nervously at her husband, who was still glaring at her. My mother died of the cholera a year ago. I am so sorry, Tom interjected. She was a delightful lady. Thank you, Caroline inclined her head sadly. My sister Agnes married in Bombay. But she was so young. Tom protested, remembering those two tomboy sisters from the Seraph. "'She is no longer a child. She is seventeen. Caroline corrected him. They were silent again, and Guy sank down into his chair, no longer trying to assert his authority over his wife. Involuntarily, Tom looked down at the child, who clung to Caroline's skirts. "'He is a beautiful child.' He raised his eyes back to her face. She nodded, as though to a question that had not been uttered. Yes, she said. He is like his father. Tom had an almost irresistible urge to go to the laughing infant and pick him up. Instead, he stepped back a pace to prevent himself doing so. Caroline, Guy intervened again, even more forcibly. I have business to conduct. Please take Christopher away. Caroline seemed to droop, and a desperate look came into her eyes as she studied Tom's face. It was good to see you again, Tom. Perhaps you will be able to visit us while you are in Zanzibar. Could you come to dine with us here at the consulate one evening? There was a wistful note in the question. I do not think Thomas will be here long enough to make social calls. Guy came to his feet again and frowned at her, as if to silence her. That is a great pity, Caroline said. Then I will say farewell now. She picked up the little boy. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye, Caroline. Carrying Christopher, she went through the door with a swish of silken skirts. The child looked back solemnly over his mother's shoulder at Tom. For long after they had gone, both brothers were silent. Then Guy said in a controlled, cold voice, You are to keep away from my family. I will not tolerate you speaking to my wife again. I challenged you to a duel once before. I will again, if you provoke me. "'It would give me little pleasure to have to kill you. "'You were never a swordsman, Guy,' Tom said, 
and he thought of William. The guilt was still a sick feeling in the pit of his stomach. I have no wish to intrude on your private life. From now on, we will touch only on matters of business. Can we agree on that? Distasteful as I find any contact with you, I agree, Guy replied. And the first matter of business is for me to repeat my question. Do you intend to indulge in any form of trade in these waters? I have reports from the harbour that your ship is heavily laden. Do you have a trading licence from the company? Do you carry trade goods? We are 8,000 miles from London. We are beyond the line, sir, and I do not recognise your authority in English law to interfere with me or question my intentions. Tom kept his temper under control with an effort. My first concern is only with Dorian. Have you made inquiry with the Sultan of Zanzibar concerning him? Guy became agitated. I have had no reason to approach the Sultan on the subject, and I forbid you to do so. I have managed to establish cordial relations with him. He is now favourably inclined towards England and the company. I do not wish to have that state of affairs disturbed by anyone making accusations against his sovereign lord, Prince al-Malik. Tom's expression changed abruptly. How did you know that al-Malik was the one who bought Dorian as a slave? I never mentioned that name. Guy looked confused and was silent for many seconds as he searched for a reply. Al-Malik is the sovereign overlord of this coast. It was natural for me to assume... By God, Guy! It was not natural for you to assume anything. You know something about what has happened to Dorian. If you don't tell me, I will go to the Sultan myself. You will not! Guy sprang to his feet. I will not have you destroying all my work here. You cannot stop me. Listen to me. Guy changed his tone. Very well. I will tell you the truth. I also heard these rumours about a white boy with red hair in the hands of the Arabs. Naturally, I thought of Dorian, so I made inquiries of the Sultan. He promised to send a messenger to Prince al-Malik to find out the truth. I am waiting to hear from the Prince. Why did you lie to me? Why did you not tell me this at once? Tom demanded. Why did I have to force it out of you? Because I know you well. I did not want you rushing in and antagonising the Sultan. My dealings with him are very sensitive. How long ago did you make these inquiries? Tom demanded. I want you to keep out of this. Guy sidestepped the question in spite of Tom's insistence. I have the whole business in my own hands. How long ago? Some time ago. Guy looked down at his desk. Dealings with the Arabs take time. When? Tom came to him and thrust his face to Guy's. When I first arrived here on the island, Guy admitted, a year ago. A year ago? Tom shouted. A year ago? Well, believe me, I will not wait that long. I will go to the Sultan this very day and demand an answer. I forbid it, Guy cried. I am the consul. Forbid all you will, Guy, Tom told him grimly. I am on my way now to the fort. I will send a full report of your behaviour to Lord Childs in London, Guy threatened desperately. The company ship in the harbour now will sail within days for England. Lord Childs will bring the full wrath of the company down upon you. There is no threat you can make that will stop me searching for Dorian. Send all the reports you wish, Guy, but it will be a year and more before you receive a reply. By then I will be a thousand miles away with Dorian in my care. Leave this house at once, sir! Guy shouted, and don't dare set foot on my threshold again. That is an invitation very much to my taste, sir. Tom crammed his hat back onto his head. I wish you good morrow. He strode to the door without looking back, and smiled as Guy yelled after him. I forbid you to go near the Sultan's palace. I shall send word to him at once that you are an interloper and do not have the protection of His Majesty, the Company, or this office. Tom strode back along the sandy path towards the harbour, and Abberley had to step out to keep up with him. Abberley had had no reply to his initial questions, so he was silent as he followed Tom. Tom was in a black rage. He wanted to storm into the Sultan's fort above the harbour, take the heathen swine by the throat, and choked the answers out of him. But he was at least able to recognise that his emotions were out of control, that once again he was on the verge of committing some violent act that could bring disaster on his enterprise. 
I must get back on board the Swallow, where I can do no more harm to myself, and talk to Aberley and Ned before I act, he told himself. But his hand strayed to the hilt of the blue Neptune sword, and his anger flew off on another tack. By God! If to save Dorian I have to take the little Swallow in against the whole Musselman fleet, I will not flinch! There was a shout behind him, so faint that at first it did not penetrate his rage. Then there was the sound of galloping hooves, and the shout came again, Tom! Tom! Wait! Wait for me! I must talk to you! Tom swung round and glared back down the track. The horse came racing towards him, the rider leaning low on its neck, white sand spurting from under the hoofs. Tom! This time he realised that it was a woman's voice. As the horse came closer, he saw skirts billowing out behind and long hair blowing on the wind. His rage was forgotten in an instant, and he stared at her in astonishment. She was riding astride and bareback, and he saw the flash of pale legs gripping the horse's flanks, naked to well above the knees, where her skirts had rucked up. She lifted one slim arm and waved at him. Tom! Despite her use of his Christian name, he did not recognise her. She brought the bay mare to a plunging halt beside where he stood, and in a rustle of skirts swung down to the ground. She tossed the reins to Aberley. Hold her, please, Aberley, she said. The big man roused himself from his shock and grabbed the reins. Tom! Oh, Tom! The strange girl ran to him and threw her arms around his neck. I thought I would never see you again. She hugged him tightly then stepped back and seized both his hands. Let me look at you. She stared into his face, and he stared back. Her long hair was a soft brown, but her face was not beautiful, the jaw too strong, her mouth too wide, especially when she smiled, as she was now. Her eyes were bright English blue, sparkling at him through long lashes. He saw at once that her skin was her main ornament. It was without blemish, but lightly touched by the tropical sun to an unfashionable golden brown. She was almost as tall as he was, her eyes looking straight into his, and she held herself easily and confidently with a boyish thrust of the hips and set of the shoulders. You don't recognise me, do you, Tom? she laughed at him. He shook his head dumbly. He found her face riveting, her eyes full of fun and alive with intelligence. Forgive me, madam, he faltered. You have me at a disadvantage. Madam, indeed, she chided him. I'm Sarah. She shook his hands. Sarah Beatty, Caroline's little sister. You used to call me the gadfly. Why are you always buzzing around my head like a gadfly, Sarah? She mimicked. Now do you remember? Sweet heavens, how you have changed, he exclaimed in astonishment, and despite himself, looked down at the shapely swell of full breasts under her bodice. As you have, Tom. What happened to your nose? He touched the end in embarrassment. It was broken. Poor Tom. She made a face of mock sympathy. But it suits you well enough. Oh, Tom, it's so good to see you. She linked her arm through his and led him down the track towards the town. Aberley fell in behind them at a respectful distance. I heard your voice when you were shouting at Guy. I could not believe it was yours, although I recognised it immediately. She gave him a roguish sideways glance. So I listened outside the door. Guy would have beaten me if he had caught me at it. Does he beat you? Tom bristled protectively. We will see to that. Oh, shush, don't be a booby. I can look after myself. But let's not waste time talking of Guy. I can only stay a moment. They'll miss me and send the servants to look for me. Sarah, there is so much we have to discuss. Tom felt strangely bereft of the thought of parting from her so soon. Her arm through his was strong and warm. There was a light fragrance around her, like an aura, that stirred something deep inside him. I know. I heard you talking to Guy about little Dorian. We all love Dorian. I want to help you, she thought quickly. There's an old ruined Jesuit monastery near the south point of the island. I'll meet you there tomorrow at two bells in the afternoon watch. She laughed at him. You see? I remember all the sailors' things you taught me. Will you be there? Of course. She released his arm, 
turned back to Uberley and embraced him. Do you remember how we used to play horsey, Uberley? You carried me on your back. A smile lit Uberley's face, transforming it. Miss Sarah, you have grown beautiful. She took the reins from him. Hand me up. He cupped a huge palm, and when she stepped into it, he boosted her easily onto the mare's back. She flashed a last smile at Tom. Don't forget, she warned him. She wheeled and slapped her heels into the mare's flanks. Tom watched her gallop away. No, he said softly. I won't forget. Effendi, my master the Sultan is indisposed. He is not able to receive any visitors, not even those as important as your exalted self. The vizier sneered at Tom. The harbour was filled with the ships of the Franks, all of their captains clamouring for an audience with his master, all seeking favours, licences to trade, permission to visit the forbidden territories further to the north. When will he see me? Tom demanded. The vizier pursed his mouth with disapproval at such a crass, unsubtle question. He knew that this young infidel commanded a tiny vessel that could carry little in the way of goods for trade, and he did not have the smell of gold about him. He was hardly worthy of serious attention. Yet he was unusual. He spoke good, intelligible Arabic and understood the etiquette of business. He had offered suitable gifts to smooth the path to the sultan. That is in the hands of Allah, the vizier shrugged gracefully. Perhaps a week, perhaps a month, I do not know. I will be back here tomorrow morning and every day thereafter until the sultan agrees to see me. Tom assured him, and I will wait for your return each day as the drought-struck earth awaits the rains, said the vizier blandly. Aberley was waiting for him at the gates of the fort, and Tom raised an eyebrow in reply to his unspoken question. He was too angry and frustrated to speak. They retraced their steps through the spice market, where the air was filled with the aroma of cloves and pepper, past the whipping block in the slave market where some incorrigible woman was chained with the flesh of her back hanging in bloody festoons, down the street of the gold merchants to the stone quay of the harbour where the longboat waited. As he took his seat in the stern sheets, Tom glanced up at the sky to judge the angle of the sun, then pulled the silver Tompion watch from his pocket and flipped open the cover. Row me around to the south point of the island, he ordered. He had checked his chart the previous night and found that the ruins of the old Jesuit monastery were marked upon it. A small cove close by should provide a landing. As the rowers pulled down the channel, close in to the coral reef that showed its teeth through the snoring surf, Tom felt his ill humour evaporate in the gay sunshine at the prospect of his rendezvous with Sarah. Ahead of the longboat he saw the swells of the open sea beating with more force on the unprotected south point of the island. When he stood up and studied the shore ahead, he could pick out the course of the freshwater stream marked by lush green vegetation as it ran down into the lagoon. There was always a pass through the reef where the sweet water inhibited the growth of the coral. As they came level with the stream, he made out the deeper water of the pass and steered through it. The beach was deserted and there was no mark of a keel upon it. Tom jumped from the bows onto the hard white sand without wetting his boots. I'll be back in an hour or so, he told Aberley. Wait for me. He found an overgrown path that ran beside the stream and forced his way along it, moving inland until it came out into the open groves of the palm trees. He saw the ruins of the monastery ahead. He increased his pace, and as he came under the tumbled walls, he called out sharply, Sarah! Are you there? There was a shriek as a flock of parakeets exploded out of the upper branches of a bow tree whose roots were embedded in the tumbled stone blocks. But no other sound. He continued on around the base of the walls, then heard a horse whinny just ahead of him. He ran forward, unable to restrain himself from showing his eagerness, and found the mare tied in the fallen gateway. Her saddle was stacked at the base of the wall, but there was no sign of her rider. He was about to call again, but thought better of it, and went on cautiously through the gateway. The building was roofless, overgrown with weed and newly germinated palm shoots from fallen coconuts, 
blue-headed lizards scurried away among the stones, and butterflies with brilliant wings floated above the tops of the flowers. He stood in the centre of the ancient courtyard and placed his hands on his hips. He remembered her mischievous ways from long ago. It was clear that she had not improved, that she was hiding from him. I am going to count to ten, he shouted, as he had when she was just a shrimp, and then I am coming to get you. Once that threat had been enough to send her and her sister squealing for cover. One, he counted, and her voice came from high above him. Guy says that you ravish young virgins. He spun round and saw her perched high on the arch of the gateway, her long legs dangling over the edge, her calves exposed beneath the hem of her skirts and her feet bare. He had walked right underneath her. He says that no decent Christian girl is safe when you are on the prowl. She put her head on one side. Is that true? Guy is a fool. Tom grinned up at her. Guy does not like you very much. No brotherly warmth in his heart. Sarah started to swing her legs, and he stared at them. They were smooth and shapely. Is Christopher truly yours? Tom almost reeled at the directness of her question. Who told you that? He tried to recover his composure. Caroline did, she replied. She hasn't stopped crying since she saw you yesterday. Tom stared up at her, and all she had told him in those few sentences left him in confusion. He could think of nothing to say. If I come down, will you promise not to pounce on me and give me a baby also? she asked sweetly, and stood up. He felt a tremor of concern as she balanced easily on top of the rickety wall, and found his voice. Have a care! You'll fall! As if she had not heard, she ran along the narrow top of the wall, jumping down from tier to tier, until she could hop down the last few feet to the ground. She was as nimble as an acrobat. I brought a picnic basket for us to share. She walked past him further into the ruins, and he followed her to one of the ancient monk's cells, which, although roofless and open to the sky, was shaded from the slanting sun. She pulled out the basket from where she had hidden it under a pile of palm fronds. She seated herself, twisting up her legs beneath her, in that double-jointed feminine attitude that he found so appealing. She arranged her skirts artlessly, giving him another heart-stopping glimpse of those lovely calves. She opened the basket, and as she set out the contents, she asked, "'Did you go to see the Sultan?' "'He refused me.' Tom sat down facing her, leaning his back against one of the blocks and crossing his legs. "'Of course!' Guy sent word to him to warn him you were coming. She changed the subject with bewildering rapidity. I helped myself to a bottle of wine from his cellar. She held it up like a trophy. It's French, and came on the last ship from home. She read the label. Corton Charlemagne. Is that good? I don't know, Tom admitted, but it sounds impressive. Guy says it's superb. My brother-in-law fancies himself a great connoisseur. He's terribly proud of it. He'd be furious if he knew we were drinking it. I'm allowed only half a glass at supper. Will you open it? She passed it to Tom and set out platters of pies and cold meat. I was truly sorry to hear about the death of your father, she said, and her face was sad suddenly. He was so kind to me and my family on the voyage out to Good Hope. Thank you, Tom replied, as he popped the cork out of the bottle, turning away to hide the shadow that passed across his face. She sensed his sorrow and smiled to cheer him again. If my own father hadn't arranged the post of consul for Guy, he'd still be a clerk in Bombay. He isn't such a lord high and mighty as he imagines he is. She put on a solemn expression that was so faithful an imitation of his brother that Tom's mood changed, and he grinned as she mimicked Guy's pompous tone and inflection. I am the youngest consul in the service of his majesty. I shall have a knighthood before I am thirty. Tom guffawed. She was a delight to be with. Then, swiftly, she changed again and became serious. Oh, Tom, what are we going to do about poor little Dorian? Guy doesn't really care. All he worries about is the company's trade with the Arabs and Lord Childs in London. He won't do anything to offend the Sultan or the Prince. Tom's expression again became grim. I will not let Guy or the Omani divert me. 
I have a fine, fast ship, and if they force me to it, I shall use it. I know exactly how you are suffering, Tom. I feel as though Dorian is my own brother. I'll do everything I can to help you, but you must be careful. Guy says that the Prince has forbidden any Christian ships to go further north than Zanzibar under penalty of seizure. He says that the Arabs will sell the crews into slavery if they transgress this decree. She leaned across and placed her hand on his forearm. Her fingers were long and tapered. They felt cool against his skin. It will be terribly dangerous. I couldn't bear it if anything happened to you, dear Tom. I can look after my ship and my crew, he assured her. But her touch was distracting. I know you can. She withdrew her hand and sparkled at him. Poor guy's wine. She set out two pewter cups. Let's see if it's as good as he boasts. She took a sip. Hmm, she murmured. You'd best keep the bottle beside you. Caroline says that ravishers ply their innocent victims with strong drink before having their way with them. She widened her eyes. And I don't want a child like Caroline, not today at least. She had a way of keeping him off balance. The blouse she wore had slipped down to expose one shoulder, but she did not seem to have noticed. Agnes has a baby now, too. She married a Captain Hicks in the Company Army at Bombay. It seems both my sisters are brood mares. It may run in the family, so I have to be very careful. You aren't married, are you, Tom? No. His voice was husky. The skin on her shoulder and arm was smooth and sun-gilded, and there were colourless hairs on her forearms, fine as silk, that caught the sun. That's good. So what are we going to do about Dorian? Do you want me to spy on Guy and find out everything I can? I don't think he will tell you much himself. I would be most grateful for your help. I can go through all his correspondence and eavesdrop on his visitors. There's a hole in the wall where the ropes for the fan go through. It makes a fine confessional. She looked mightily pleased with herself. But, of course, we will have to meet here regularly so that I can report to you. Tom found that prospect far from distasteful. Do you remember the concerts we used to have in the evenings on board the Seraph? she asked, and burst spontaneously into the chorus of Spanish ladies. Her voice was true and unaffected, and Tom, tone deaf as he was, was stirred by it. The hair on the back of his neck prickled, and he was sorry when she stopped. What happened to Master Walsh, our teacher? she asked. He was such a funny little man. He is with me on the swallow and he went on to tell her about all the crew she remembered from the Seraph. She wept when he told her how big Daniel Fisher had died, and he wanted to take her in his arms to comfort her. Instead, he changed the subject and told her about how they had captured the swallow and about the long voyage out. She listened rapidly, wiped away the tears, and applauded his courage and ingenuity. Soon she was chatting easily again, flitting from subject to subject, as though she had stored up a hundred questions for him in the years they had been apart. Tom was intrigued. The longer he studied her face, the more he decided that his first appraisal had been in error. Perhaps her features were not pretty, her nose and mouth were too large, her jaw too square, but put together with the animation and spirit that lit them, he decided she was almost beautiful. Her eyes crinkled when she laughed and she had a little trick of lifting her chin when she asked a question, which he liked. The shadows moved out across the courtyard as they talked. Suddenly she broke off in the middle of a hilarious description of her family's arrival in Bombay and their reaction to the unfamiliar, exotic new world. Oh, Tom, it's late. The time went so quickly. I've stayed too long. Hastily she gathered up the plates and empty wine cups. I must go. Guy will be furious if he even suspects where I've been. Guy's not your master, Tom frowned. He's the master of our household. My father placed me in his care when mother died. For Caroline's sake, I have to humour him. He takes out his ill temper on her. Are you happy living with Guy and Caroline, Sarah? He felt that even in the short time they had spent together, he knew her well enough to ask such a delicate question. I can think of other circumstances which would please me better, she said, almost inaudibly without looking up from the picnic basket. Then she pulled on her discarded shoes and jumped to her feet. Tom picked up the basket, and she placed one slim hand on his arm, as if she needed to steady herself over the uneven ground. It was only a short time ago, though, 
that he had seen her dancing along the top of the high wall. When will you come again to give me report of what Guy is doing? Tom asked, as he lifted the pannier basket onto the mare's back. Not tomorrow. I promised to help Caroline with Christopher. But the next day, at the same time? He placed his hands on her waist and lifted her up into the saddle. He hoped she realised the strength that that simple act had required, for she was no delicate lily of a girl. Today she was riding side-saddle. She hooked one leg around the horn, and he helped her arrange her long skirts. Then she looked down at him as he stood by her stirrup. "'Oh, Tom,' she said impulsively, "'it's been such fun. Life on the island is so restricted and boring.' Guy won't even let me go into the town on my own. I cannot last remember when I enjoyed myself so much. Then she seemed overcome by embarrassment at her lack of restraint. Without waiting for his response, she urged the mare away and raced off down the sandy path through the palm groves. She sat tall and regal in the saddle. All 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 in the saddle, 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 all in the saddle. Track 13 As Tom came up the causeway from the harbour in Zanzibar and passed below the portcullis of the fort, he saw two men coming towards him deep in conversation. He caught a snatch of their words as they passed him, enough to be sure that they were speaking English, and he turned back after them. "'God love you, gentlemen,' he called. "'It's good to hear the Christian tongue spoken in this heathen land. "'May I introduce myself? Robert Davenport.' "'He used the pseudonym he had chosen to protect himself "'from the murder warrant that he knew must follow him. "'The two Englishmen turned to face him, their expressions guarded. "'Only then Tom recognised them as the captain "'and one of the officers from the East Indiaman in the harbour. "'He had seen them rowed ashore from the ship earlier in the day.' "'I hope you have enjoyed a good voyage thus far?' Tom asked, when they had reluctantly introduced themselves and shaken hands, still stiff and reserved. "'I presume that you were coming from an audience of the Sultan?' "'Yes,' the captain nodded curtly. He did not volunteer further information, and Tom had to fish again. "'What's the fellow like? This will be my first meeting with him. Does he speak any English?' He speaks only his own godforsaken lingo, the man replied. I wish you luck in your dealings with him. He is a crafty devil, and you will need all the luck you can muster. He bowed. Now, if you will excuse me, sir. Tom strode into the fort, his anger bubbling over. He now had proof of what Sarah had told him. At the instigation of Guy, his own brother, the vizier was fobbing him off. A servant of the vizier tried to delay him in the antechamber, but Tom brushed past him. He knew his way to the inner cabinet. He jerked aside the thick silk curtains that covered the doorway and barged through. The vizier was seated on the low platform at the far side of the room. The room stank of incense and hashish. There was a writing tablet in front of him and a secretary beside him offering documents one at a time for his signature. The vizier looked up, startled by Tom's precipitate entrance. A minute ago I spoke to the English captain who was coming from an audience of His Excellency, Tom announced. I was pleased to hear that the Sultan has recovered so swiftly from his indisposition, he went on in Arabic, for this means that he is now able to meet me and respond to my petition. The vizier scrambled to his feet, but Tom brushed past him, making for the doorway beyond. You cannot go in there, he cried fearfully, but Tom ignored him. Guard, the vizier shouted, stop that man! A big man in a long robe and half-armour appeared in the doorway and blocked Tom's way. He had his hand on the pommel of the sheathed scimitar on his belt. Tom stepped up to him and seized his sword arm at the wrist. The guard tried to draw his weapon, but Tom held his arm and crushed his wrist in a vicious grip that made him wince, looking over his shoulder into the room beyond. "'Greetings, mighty lord,' he called to the man who reclined on a mound of cushions. "'I call down all the blessings of Allah upon you and offer you my humble and dutiful respects. "'I beg to address you on a matter of mercy. "'As the prophet himself has said, the small child and the widow are deserving of our compassion.' "'The sultan blinked at him and sat upright. "'He wore a stiff jacket of heavily brocaded silk over scarlet pantaloons.' 
gathered at the waist with a girdle of gold filigree. His turban was scarlet to match his trousers, and his beard was bushy and thick. He tugged at it nervously. He had not expected to be confronted by this barbaric Frank, quoting the sacred words of the Koran at him. The vizier had run after Tom. Now he thrust himself between them. Forgive me, Lord. I tried to stop him. This is the mean and worthless unbeliever of whom I told you. I will call the guard to have him removed. Let him be, the sultan said. I will listen to what he has to say. Tom released the guard's wrist and pushed him aside. This mean and worthless unbeliever thanks the mighty Sultan Ali Muhammad and presents his humble respects. His words were so much at odds with his behaviour that the Sultan smiled. Speak to me then on this compassionate matter, he invited. I seek a child, my own brother. He was lost two years ago. I have good reason to suspect that he is being held captive in the territories of the Omani. The Sultan's expression became guarded. My brother is a subject of His Majesty King William III. There is a treaty between your Caliph and our King which forbids the enslavement of their subjects. I know who you are. The Sultan held up his hand to silence Tom. I have heard from the English Consul concerning you. I have also received inquiries from the Consul about this child. These matters are being investigated. There is nothing more I can tell you until I receive a reply from the court of the Caliph in Muscat. It is a year and more since... Tom began angrily, but the Sultan stopped him. I am sure that you must realise the folly of arousing the displeasure of the Caliph by importuning him on such a trivial matter as this. It is no trivial matter, Tom protested. My family is noble and wields much influence. And to the Caliph it is a trivial matter. However, His Majesty is a man of great compassion. We can rest assured that we will hear from him if he can tell us anything about the boy. He will reply to these queries when he has something to tell us. In the meantime, we must wait upon his grace. How long? Tom demanded. How long must we wait? As long as is necessary. The Sultan made the gesture of dismissal. Next time you burst in upon me like an enemy... I will treat you as one, Englishman, he warned coldly. When Tom had been led away, the Sultan summoned his vizier, and the man prostrated himself before him. Forgive me, mighty lord, I am dust before you. I tried to prevent that mad Frank. The Sultan silenced him with a wave of his hand. Send word to the English consul that I wish to speak to him immediately. Guy went down to the fort yesterday. The Sultan sent for him, Sarah told Tom. When he came back, he had a black dog on his back. He beat one of the grooms senseless and shouted at Caroline and me. He didn't beat you, Tom asked. I swear I'll thrash him into a pulp if he raises a hand to you. He tried that once, Sarah laughed, and shook out her hair so that it danced in the monsoon wind. I doubt he'll do it again. I broke one of his precious Chinese vases over his head. It didn't bleed much, but he behaved as if he was dying. But enough of that. I was giving you my report. Stand by about, Tom interrupted her, and she jumped to the mizzen halyard of the little felucca. She was learning the ropes quickly, and was already a handy crew. Tom had hired the craft in Zanzibar Harbour for a few rupees a day, and they laid her on a tack to round the south point of the island. Then Sarah came back to sit beside him. So, after throwing the entire household into pandemonium, Guy spent the rest of the afternoon in his room. At supper, he spoke hardly a word, but drank two bottles of port and another of Madeira. It took two servants to help Caroline and me carry him up to bed. So, my twin has become a sot, Tom asked. No, it was most unusual. The first time I've seen him drink himself into a stupor. You seem to have a strange effect on people. She made the double-edged remark with such insouciance that Tom was not certain how to interpret it. She went on lightly. After we tucked him up and Caroline was beside him in the bed, I went down to the office and found he had written a sheaf of letters. I made copies of those that concern us. She pulled out the folded pages from the pocket of her skirt. This one is to Lord Childs and this to your brother William. She handed them to him and the sheets fluttered in her hand. Take the tiller, 
He handed it to her, and Sarah perched up on the transom, her skirts pulled up to her knees to let the sun and wind play on her skin. With an effort, Tom averted his eyes from those long, strong limbs and focused his attention on the papers. He frowned as he read the first letter, and as he continued, the frown turned into a dark scowl. A treacherous bastard, he exclaimed, then was immediately contrite. Forgive me, I did not mean to use rough language. She laughed, crinkling her eyes. If Guy is a bastard, that makes you one also. We'd better choose another description. How about toad or, or bunghole? Tom felt himself blush. He had not expected to be outdone in the use of invective. Hurriedly, he switched his attention back to the letter to William. It was an eerie feeling to read words directed to the man he had killed. When he finished reading, he tore both letters to shreds and threw them up into the air. They watched them fly away like white gulls on the wind. So tell me about your audience with the Sultan. Every last detail, Sarah demanded. Before replying, Tom stood up and went to the foot of the mast. He lowered the lateen sail, and immediately the motion of the felucca changed. She no longer plunged and wrestled with the wind, but gave herself to it like a lover, with a gentle swoop and climb. He went back and sat close to Sarah, but not quite touching her. I had to force my way into his inner cabinet, he said, but I had armed myself with a quotation from the Koran. He described the meeting to her, repeating the exchanges word for word, and she listened solemnly, not interrupting once, which he realised even from their short acquaintance was unusual. Once or twice during the recital, Tom lost the thread and repeated himself. Her eyes were wide set, and the whites were clear, and so white that they seemed to be tinged with a faint bluish radiance, like those of a healthy infant. Their faces were so close together that he could trace that elusive fragrance to her breath. When he had finished speaking, they were both silent, but neither made any move to pull apart. Sarah broke the silence. Are you planning to kiss me, Tom? She stroked the long tendrils of hair back from her face with one hand. Because if you are, this is a good time for it. There's no one to spy on us. He moved his face towards hers, then stopped with only an inch between their lips, overcome by an almost religious sense of awe and sacrilege. I don't want to do anything that will give you offence, he croaked. Don't be a booby, Tom Courtney. Despite the insult, her voice was husky and her eyes closed slowly, the thick, dark lashes interlacing. She ran the pink tip of her tongue over her lips, then pursed them expectantly. Tom felt an almost irresistible urge to seize her and crush her body against his own. Instead, he touched his lips to hers as lightly as a butterfly settling on a petal. The moisture on them tasted faintly sweet, and he felt that he might suffocate with the pressure in his chest. After a moment, he drew back. Her eyes flew open. They were startlingly green. Damn you, Tom Courtney, she said. I have waited so long. And that was the best you could do? You are so soft and beautiful, he stammered. I, I don't want to hurt you or make you despise me. If you don't want me to despise you, then you must do better than that. She closed her eyes again and leaned towards him. He hesitated only a heartbeat longer, then seized her, wrapped her in his arms and crushed her mouth with his. She made a small mewing sound of surprise and stiffened with shock, at the unexpected power of his embrace, then flung herself forward, meeting his kiss with such abandon that their lips were forced open, their teeth clashed together, the softness and wetness of their mouths melded and their tongues entwined. A larger wave hit the side of the drifting felucca and tumbled them from their perch on the transom. It did not break their embrace, and they fell to the deck oblivious of the smell of the bilges and of the dried fish scales that covered the hard planks beneath them. Tom! Tom! She was trying to speak without lifting her mouth from his. Yes, oh, so long, I never thought. Oh, yes, you're so strong. Don't stop now. He wanted to devour her, to engulf her completely. The lining of her mouth was slippery and her tongue was a maddening goad. His senses swam, the universe closed in upon him until this warm, fragrant body in his arms was all of existence. 
At last they had to free their mouths to breathe. It was only for a moment, just long enough for her to gasp, Tom, oh Tom, I have loved you from the first moment I saw you. All these years I thought I had lost you. Then they flew at each other again, moaning and clawing at each other, her arms locked about his neck, bruising their lips against each other's mouth and teeth. Blindly he groped for her breasts, and when he found them, their shape and elastic weight made him cry out aloud as if in pain. He fumbled at the fastening of her bodice, but he was clumsy and inexpert. Impatiently she pushed away his hands and undid the ribbon. She reached in and scooped out one of her breasts and pushed it into his hand, closing his fingers over it. There, she said into his mouth, it's yours. Everything is yours. He kneaded her flesh, and though she whimpered, she exulted in the pain. Oh, I have hurt you, he pulled away. I'm sorry, truly I'm sorry. No, no, she reached for his hands and replaced them on her bosom. Do it. Do whatever you want. He stared at the breast in his hand. It was as white as though it had been freshly carved from ivory, but with the pink marks of his rough fingers on it. It filled his cupped hand. The nipple was engorged and hard, dark with blood. So beautiful. I have never seen anything so beautiful. He bowed his head and placed his lips on the nipple. She arched her back thrusting her chest up to meet him. She reached up with both hands, twisted and entwined her fingers in the thick springing curls at the back of his head, guiding his mouth. When at last he lifted it to look at her face, she locked her mouth on his once more. He was on top of her now, and suddenly she realised what that hardness was, that he was pushing against her thighs and belly. She had never felt it before, but often she and Caroline had discussed it, and she had wheedled every detail out of her elder sister. As the realisation struck her, she stopped breathing and stiffened with shock. Immediately, Tom tried to break away again. I, I didn't mean to frighten you. We, we should stop now. The threat terrified her. She was desperate at the thought of being deprived of him and the hardness of his body. She pulled him back. Please, Tom, don't go away. Almost timidly, he embraced her again, but he arched his lower body away from her. She wanted to feel him again, that wondrous man-thing hard against her. She reached around behind him and locked her hands over his buttocks, pulling him in and hunting for him with straining hips. Yes, she had found him. Oh, yes. She was in a transport, her emotions tumbling and twisting like a twig caught in a whirlpool. She felt him tugging at her clothing, reaching down between them and she realised what he was trying to do. She raised herself on her shoulders and heels, arching her bottom off the deck, and reached down to help him, pulling her skirts over her thighs, then as high as her navel. The monsoon wind was cool on her naked belly, and Tom was kneeling over her, plucking frantically at the fastenings of his breeches. She raised herself on her elbows, wanting to see him. Caroline's descriptions had been graphic, but she wanted to see for herself. Tom was taking so long, she felt she could not wait any longer. She wanted to help him and stretched out her hand. Then, with one movement, he wrenched his breeches down to his knees, and she gasped aloud. Nothing her sister had told her had prepared her for this. Staring at him, she fell back on the hard deck, and her legs fell apart weakly, as if she had no control of them. A long time later, he lay heavy and inert on top of her. He was gasping like a man rescued from drowning. Droplets of his sweat had fallen upon her like rain and wet the front of her bodice, her face and her bare breast. She had locked her legs around him and she held him still. The felucca under them rocked them like infants in the cradle. Tom stirred and tried to rise, but she tightened the grip of her arms and legs to prevent him leaving her. He sighed raggedly and slumped back on top of her. She felt a strange sense of triumph and possession, as though she had achieved something of almost mystical importance, something beyond mere flesh. She could not find the words to describe it to herself, but she stroked his head and murmured gentle but incoherent endearments to him. With infinite regret and a sense of aching loss, she felt him shrivel inside her. 
and though she ached where he had forced his way into her, she tightened her muscles and tried to hold him in. But he slipped away, and she had to let him sit up. He looked about him with a bewildered expression. We have drifted a league out to sea. She sat up beside him, smoothing down her skirts, and saw that the island was a blue line on the horizon. Tom came up on his knees, pulling up his breeches, and she watched him. She felt maternal and protective, as though she had miraculously become a full woman, as though she had put her girlhood behind her, that she was now the strong one, and he the child, who must be fostered and cherished. Tom staggered to the halyard, unsteady on his feet, raised the sail and put the felucca on the wind. Sarah straightened her clothing and retied the ribbon of her bodice, then rose from the deck and went to sit with him at the tiller. He put his arm around her shoulders, and she snuggled close to him. They were halfway back to the island before either of them spoke. "'I love you, Sarah Beatty," he said. She rejoiced to hear him say it and tightened her embrace. "'As I said before, I have loved you since the first day I laid eyes upon you, Tom Courtney. Even though I was only a child, I prayed that one day I would be your woman. "'That day has come,' he said, and kissed her again. They met as often as Sarah could escape the vigilance of Caroline and Guy. Sometimes the intervals between their meetings were two or three days, but then their passion was inflamed by the delay. These trysts were always in the afternoons, for in the mornings Sarah helped her sister run the household or looked after little Christopher. Neither could Tom leave the Swallow and his crew. The ship had suffered extensive storm damage to her howl and rigging after leaving Good Hope, and this had to be repaired the ship made fully seaworthy again. Most mornings Tom was up at the fort, for he was desperate to have news of Dorian from Muscat, and he was still waiting for his license to trade. Although he lavished flattery and buckshish on the vizier, he was still in bad grace, and the vizier punished him with flowery excuses and apologies for the delay. Without the sultan's firman in his hands, Tom could not deal in the island markets. Those precious hours when Tom and Sarah could be together sped by too swiftly for both of them. Some afternoons they lay in each other's arms, not bothering to touch the delicacies that Sarah had brought with her, making love as though it were for the last time. In the intervals between they talked, breathless in their need to say everything they felt for each other, making fantastic plans for the future, for the time when they could escape the island together and, with Dorian, sail away in the swallow. On other days they took the felucca and sailed to the outer reefs, anchoring over the coral and fishing with hand lines, laughing and shouting with excitement as they dragged up the lovely creatures from the depths, kicking on the lines, sparkling like great gemstones in the sunlight as they were swung inboard. One afternoon Sarah brought the box of dueling pistols her father had given her when they parted in Bombay. For her protection in this land of wild animals and wilder men, Papa promised to teach me to shoot, but he never found time, she told him. Will you teach me now, Tom? They were magnificent weapons. The grips were carved from lustrous walnut, and the locks and long rifled barrels were chased with gold and silver. There were ramrods of horn and powder flasks of silver. Fitted into the case was a screw-top pot containing fifty lead balls that had been selected to ensure that they were perfectly round and symmetrical. The patches were of oiled leather. Tom loaded with half measures of powder to reduce the recoil. Then he showed her how to place her feet and address the target, turned half away, presenting her right shoulder. Then with her left fist on her hip, to bring up the weapon with a straight right arm, pick up the foresight bead in the notch of the back sight, and fire as she swung through the target, rather than trying to hold her aim until her arm ached and shook. He set up a coconut on top of one of the low walls of the monastery, fifteen paces away. "'Knock it off,' he said, and called her missus. "'Low. Still low. Right.' He reloaded swiftly, and she changed pistols. With the fourth shot, she sent the nut spinning and spraying milk. She squealed gleefully, and soon she was hitting more often than she missed. "'I should be given a prize for each hit,' she demanded. What sort of prize did you have in mind? A kiss might be appropriate. 
With this incentive, she hit five nuts in succession, and Tom told her, Clever girl, you have won the grand prize. He picked her up in his arms and carried her, protesting weakly and insincerely, through the gateway into their secret place in the ruins. A few days later, he brought one of London's best muskets with him in the felucca and showed her how to load and fire it. Tom had purchased four of these extraordinary weapons before they sailed from England. He could not afford to buy more, for they were staggeringly expensive. The cheap military muskets were smooth-bored, and the ball did not fit snugly in the barrel, so spin was not imparted to it as it was driven through the lands. Because they were not stabilised, the balls flew erratically. However, with this rifled weapon, the accuracy was startling. Tom could be sure of hitting a coconut with every shot at 150 paces. Sarah was tall and strong enough to be able to level the heavy musket from her shoulder without difficulty, and once again she proved she had the quickness of hand and eye to make her a natural marksman. Within an hour of practice she was able to claim her reward from him after almost every shot. "'I suppose the next thing I shall have to teach you is sword play," Tom remarked, as they lay together on the plaited sleeping mat with which they had now furnished their secret roofless cell in the monastery. "'You have done a fine job of that already,' she grinned wickedly and reached down his body. "'Here is my trusty sword, and, sir, I know already full well how to play with it.' In serious mood, they discussed their plans for when Tom had succeeded in rescuing Dorian. "'I will come back for you,' he said, "'and take you with me, away from Zanzibar and Guy.' "'Yes,' she nodded, as though she had never doubted that. "'And then we will sail back to England together, won't we, Tom?' She saw his expression change. "'What is it, my darling?' she asked anxiously. "'I can never return to England.' he said softly. She scrambled to her knees and stared at him in dismay. What do you mean, never return home? Listen to me, Sarah. He sat up and took both her hands in his. Something terrible happened before I left England. Something I, I never intended. Tell me, she pleaded. Anything that touches you touches me. And so he told her about William. He started at the beginning, describing their childhood and the growing tyranny the elder brother had exerted over the younger ones. He recounted many small incidents of heartless cruelty that William had inflicted. I think the only time that Dory and Guy and I were happy were when we were free of him, those times when he was away at university, he said. Her expression was filled with sympathy. I did not like him when I met him at High Weald, she agreed. He reminded me of a serpent, cold and poisonous. Tom nodded. I had almost forgotten how vindictive he could be when I was away from home, on the voyage of the Seraph, but when we took Father home after Flor de Lamar, it was all brought back to me with a vengeance. He told her how William had treated their father when he was dying, and how he had repudiated his oath to help find Dorian after Hal's death. We fought, he said. We had fought before, often, but never like this. He paused, and the pain of the memory was so plain to see that she tried to embrace him to make him stop the recital. No, Sarah, I have to tell you everything. You have to listen so that you can understand how it happened. Sometimes halting, at other times, in a fierce rush of words, he told her about that fight on his last night at High Weald. You asked how I broke my nose, and I could not tell you then. He touched the lump. Billy did that. He described the battle in simple words that were so vivid and affecting that Sarah paled and clutched his arm, sinking her nails into his flesh. In the end, I could not kill him, though he deserved it a hundred times. I was moved by Alice, as she stood there with the baby in her arms, pleading for his life, and I could not kill him. I put up my sword and rode away, thinking that was the end of it. But I should have known my brother better than that. There is more, she asked in a small, frightened voice. I don't think I can bear to hear more. I have to tell you all of it, and you must listen so that you can understand. 
he came at last to the fatal meeting on the river landing below the Tower of London. He described the fight with the band of hired cutthroats. His voice sank lower and lower, and there were long pauses as he searched for the words to describe the terrible climax. I still did not know it was Billy. It, it was dark. He wore a wide hat, and his face was covered. I thought he was the boatman, and I ran to him, asking him to ferry us away. I was thunderstruck when he drew out the pistol. He fired, and the ball struck me here. He lifted his shirt and displayed the long pink scar across his ribs beneath his arm. She stared at it, then reached out to trace the raised, twisted cicatrices with her fingertips. She had noticed the scar before, but when she had questioned him, he had been evasive and dismissive. Now she knew why. He might have killed you, she breathed in awe. Yes, I thought he had, but luckily the ball struck my ribs and glanced away. It knocked me off my feet, and Billy stood over me and aimed the second barrel. That shot would have finished the business. The sword was in my hand. I was afraid, terrified. I threw with all my strength, and it hit him full in the chest and went through his heart. Oh, merciful God! Sarah stared at him. You killed your own brother. I did not know it was Billy, not even then, not until I lifted the hat from his head and saw his face. They were silent a while. Sarah looked horrified. Then she rallied. He was trying to kill you, she said firmly. You had to do it, Tom, to save yourself. She saw the desolation in his eyes, reached out, took his head and pulled it to her bosom, holding him there, stroking his hair. There is no blame. You had to do it. I have told myself that a thousand times. Tom's voice was muffled. But... He was my brother. God is just. I know that he forgives you, my darling. You must put it behind you. He lifted his face, and she knew that there was nothing she could say to ease the pain. It would haunt him if he lived a hundred years. She kissed him. None of it makes any difference to us, Tom. I am your woman forever. If we can never go back to England, then let it be so. I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Nothing matters but you and me and our love. She drew him down onto the sleeping mat and offered him the comfort of her body. Still the swallow waited in the harbour. They had completed the repairs long since, and she was once more sleek and lovely. Her howl glistened with new paint, but her canvas stayed furled, and she snubbed restlessly on her anchor cables like a falcon at bait. Her crew were growing restless. There had been a number of ugly fights among them, their nerves rubbed raw by inactivity, and Tom knew he could not hold them much longer in idleness, like prisoners on their own ship, more and more, Tom was tempted to defy the Sultan's decree and sail north into those forbidden seas where he knew Dorian was held captive, or to take the swallow across to the mainland and search for those hidden places in the mysterious interior where the ivory, gold and gum Arabic were harvested. Aberly and Ned Tyler advised patience, but Tom rounded on them angrily. Patience is for old men. Fortune never smiled on patience. The monsoon fell away into the breathless period of the doldrums, then swung right round the compass and whispered almost inaudibly out of the northeast, those first gentle breaths that herald the change of the season, harbinger of the big rains of the Kaskazi. The Kaskazi gathered strength, and the heavily laden trading ships in the harbour hoisted their anchors, spread their canvas to the fresh new wind, and bore away southwards to round good hope. The swallow waited in the almost empty harbour. Then, on one of Tom's regular visits to the fort, the vizier greeted him as though he were newly arrived in the port, and offered him a seat on a brocaded cushion and a thimble cup of thick, sweet black coffee. All my efforts on your behalf have borne fruit. His Excellency the Sultan has looked favourably on your petition for a licence to trade. He smiled disarmingly, and produced the document from the sleeve of his robe. Here is his firman. Tom reached for it eagerly, but the vizier slipped it back into his sleeve. 
The vermin is restricted to the island of Zanzibar alone. It does not entitle you to sail further north or to call at any port on the mainland. If you do so, your ship will be seized and the crew with it. Tom tried to hide his irritation. I understand, and I am grateful for the generosity of the Sultan. A tax will be levied on any goods you acquire in the markets, which must be paid for in gold before the goods are loaded aboard your ship. The tax is one-fifth part of the value of all goods. Tom swallowed hard, but kept on smiling politely. His Excellency is generous. The vizier held out the document, but as Tom reached for it, he again withdrew it and exclaimed at his own forgetfulness. Ah! Oh, forgive me, Effendi. I have overlooked a small matter of the license fee. A thousand rupees in gold, and, of course, another five hundred rupees for my own intercession with His Excellency. With the royal firman at last in his grasp, Tom could visit the markets. Each day he came ashore at dawn, bringing Master Walsh and Aberley with him, and he returned to the ship only at the hour of Zor, the early afternoon prayer when the merchants closed their stalls to answer the call of the moison to their devotions. For the first few weeks he made no purchases, but each day sat for hours with one or other of the merchants, drinking coffee and exchanging pleasantries, examining their wares without any show of enthusiasm, striking no deals, but comparing price and quality. Tom had believed at first that his bargaining power would be strengthened by most of the other European traders having sailed already with the Kaskazi, and that there would be little competition for the goods on offer. He soon found that this was far from the case. The other traders had picked over the goods and selected the best. The ivory tusks remaining in the market were mostly immature, few any longer than his arm, many deformed and discoloured. There was nothing even approaching that mighty pair his father had purchased from Consul Grey on their first visit to the island. Despite the poor quality, the merchants were already fat with profits, and they maintained their prizes, shrugging indifferently when he protested. Effendi, there are few men who hunt the beasts. It is dangerous work, and each season they have to travel further to find the herds. Now it is very late in the season. The supply of ivory has been taken up by the other Frankish traders, one of the merchants explained smoothly. However, I have a few fine slaves for your consideration. With all the grace he could muster, Tom refused the offer to examine these human chattels. Aberley had been captured as a slave in childhood, but every detail of the horrors inflicted upon him had remained starkly clear in his memory. Before he had ever sailed from the shores of England, Tom had grown up with his descriptions of the highness trade. During his many voyages, Tom's father had accumulated first-hand knowledge of the trade, and he had helped instill in the young Tom an abhorrence of its inhuman practices. Since he had first rounded Good Hope, Tom had come in regular contact with the slavers and their victims. During their long wait in Zanzibar roads, there had always been slave ships anchored close to them, near enough for the stink and heartbreaking sounds to carry clearly to where the swallow was lying. Each day now he walked with Aberley through the slave compounds, and it was more difficult to ignore the misery all around them, the wailing of children torn from their parents' arms, the weeping of bereaved mothers, and the dumb suffering in the dark eyes of young men and women deprived of their free, wild existence, chained like animals, abused in a language they did not understand, spread-eagled on the whipping block, flogged with the vicious hippo-hide kiboko, until their ribs showed white in the wounds. The very thought of making a profit out of the torment of these lost souls made the bile rise in the back of Tom's throat. Back on the Swallow, he discussed their predicament with his ship's officers. Although the foremost object of the voyage was to find Dorian, and Tom never wavered from that goal, had a duty to his crew, and he had inveigled many of them aboard with the promise of reward. So far, there had been no rewards, and there was little prospect of any profit to share with them. There are few bargains to be had hereabouts, Master Walsh confirmed lugubriously. He opened his notebook, adjusted his gold-rimmed spectacles on his nose, and quoted the list of the ivory and gum Arabic prices he had compiled before they left England. The price of spices is more favourable, but still leaves little profit when we take into account the hardships and expenses of the voyage. The cloves and pepper now, well, there is always a ready market for them, 
and to a lesser extent for cinnamon, and, of course, the quinchona bark is in demand in America and in the Mediterranean countries afflicted by malaria. We must have a few hundred weight of quinchona for our own use, Tom cut in. Now that the big rains are beginning, there will be much fever among the men. The boiled extract from the bark was bitter as gall, but a century ago the Jesuit monks had discovered that it was a sovereign remedy for the malarial fever. It had been the fathers who had first introduced the conchona trees to this island. Now it grew here profusely. Yes, agreed Abeli softly, you will need the conchona, especially if you are going inland to search for your own ivory. Tom looked at him sharply. What made you think I would be so foolhardy as to flout the decrees of the Sultan and John Company, Abeli? Even you have counselled me strongly against such a course. I have watched you sitting in the bows each evening and staring across the channel at the African mainland. Your thoughts were so loud that they almost deafened me. It would be dangerous, Tom stopped short of denying the accusation but his head turned instinctively towards the west, and a dreamy look came into his eyes as he stared across at the hazy outline of the land fading into the dusk shadows. This has never stopped you before, Abeli pointed out. I would not know where to begin. It is a land unknown, terra incognita. He used the caption from the charts in his cabin that he had studied so avidly. Not even you have travelled out there, Abeli. It would be folly to go without a guide to lead us. No, I do not know this northern land, Abeli agreed. I was born much further south, near the great river Zambezi, and it is many years since I was last there. He paused. But I know where we can find somebody who can lead us into the interior. Who? Tom asked, unable to hide his excitement. Where will we find this man? What is his name? I do not yet know his name or his face, but I will recognize him when I see him. When they went ashore the next morning, the first chained files of slaves were being led to the market from the barracoons where they had been incarcerated overnight. Like all the other commodities at this late season, their ranks were thinned and fewer than 200 specimens were on offer. When the swallow had first arrived, there had been several thousand for sale. Most of those remaining were old or frail, thin with sickness or scarred from the kiboko. Buyers were always chary of a whip-marked slave, for it usually meant that he or she was incorrigible, not amenable to training. Previously, when passing through the market, Tom had averted his gaze and tried to avoid studying them, his repugnance and pity too troubling. But now he and Abeli took up a position at the main gate of the slave market from which they could watch the sorry columns being herded past. They scrutinised every individual as he came level with them. There were two or three black men in the ranks who seemed to Tom to be of the type they were seeking, tall and strong and heroic despite their chains. But when he touched Abeli's arm and glanced at him in inquiry, Abeli shook his head impatiently. Nothing? Tom asked quietly, despondent. The last of the slaves were filing past, and Abeli had shown no interest in any of them. "'Our man is there,' Abeli contradicted him. "'But the slave-masters were watching us. I could not point him out.' The slaves were led to their stalls around the square, and each was chained to his post. The masters took their seats in the shade, wealthy men, complacent, richly dressed, attended by their personal slaves who brewed coffee for them and lit the hookahs. Eyes hooded and sly, they watched Tom and Abeli as they made a slow circuit of the market. Abeli stopped at the first stall and examined one of the slaves. A big man and a warrior by his looks, the slave master pulled open his mouth to show his teeth as though he were a horse and palpated his muscles. Not more than twenty years of age, Effendi! the Arab said. Look at these arms, strong as a bullock. There is another thirty years' hard work in him. Abeli spoke to the slave in one of the dialects of the forests, but the man stared back at him like a dumb animal. Abeli shook his head, and they passed on to the next door to repeat the routine. Tom realised he was slowly working his way towards the man he had already selected. He looked ahead, 
trying to guess which he was, and then with sudden certainty he recognised him. He was naked except for a brief loincloth, a small man with a thin wiry body. There was no fat or soft flesh on him. His hair was a thick unkempt bush like that of a wild animal, but his eyes were bright and piercing. Gradually, Tom and Uberly approached the group in which he was tethered, and Tom was careful to feign disinterest in the one they had chosen. They inspected another man and a young girl. Then, much to the slave master's chagrin, made as if to move on. As if in afterthought, Uberly turned back to the little man. Show me his hands, he demanded of the slave master, who nodded to his assistant. Between them, they grabbed the slave's wrists, and the chains clanked, as they forced him to extend his hands for Abberley's scrutiny. Turned them over, Abberley ordered, and they turned them palm uppermost. Abberley concealed his satisfaction. The first two fingers of both the man's hands were calloused to the extent of being almost deformed. This is our man, he said to Tom in English, but his inflection made it sound like a rejection. Tom shook his head, as if confirming his rejection. They turned away, leaving the disappointed slave master staring after them. What is it about his hands? Tom asked, without looking back. What is it that has marked them that way? The bowstring, Abberley said curtly. Both hands? Tom stopped with surprise. He is an elephant hunter, Abberley explained. But keep walking, and I will explain it to you. The elephant bow is so stiff that no man can draw it from the shoulder. The hunter creeps close, that close. He pointed out a wall ten paces away. Then he lies on his back, both feet on the stock of the bow. He lays the tip of the arrow between his big toes, and he draws with both hands on the string. Over the years of hunting, the bowstring marks his fingers like that. Tom had difficulty visualizing a bow of that power. Must be a formidable weapon, this bow. It can shoot an arrow clean through the body of an ox from shoulder to shoulder and go on to kill a man standing on the other side, Abberley said. That man is one of the small intrepid brotherhood who live by hunting the great beasts. They completed their leisurely round of the market, then casually returned to where the little man stood. He is double-chained at ankles and wrists. Abberley pointed out in English, and look at his back. Tom saw the half-healed scars that crisscrossed the dark skin. They have beaten him savagely, trying to break him to their will. But you can see by his eyes that they have not succeeded. Abberley circled the little man slowly, peering at his muscular frame, and said something to him in a language Tom did not understand. There was no reaction from the slave. Tom watched his eyes and saw that they were sullen and uncomprehending. Abberley spoke two words in another of the forest dialects. There was still no sign from the little man that he understood. Tom knew that besides his mother tongue, the language Abberley had taught him when he was a child, Abberley spoke at least a dozen other lesser dialects of the far interior. Now he switched again. This time the little man started and turned his head to stare at Abberley in confusion and amazement. He replied with a single word, Fondi. That is his name, Abberley explained to Tom, still in English. He is of the Lozi, a fierce warrior tribe. His name means the Adept, Abberley smiled. He probably merits it. Tom accepted the slave master's invitation to drink a cup of coffee the essential accompaniment to any civilised session of bargaining. Within a very short time, Tom sensed that the slave-master was eager to rid himself of his small but truculent merchandise, and he was able to press the advantage. After an hour of haggling, the slave-master threw up his hands in despair. My children will starve. You have ruined me with your intransigence. You leave me a pauper, but take him. Take him and my very blood and bones with him. When they had Fundi, the adept, on board the Swallow, Tom called for the blacksmith and had the chains knocked off his ankles and wrists. The little man rubbed the galled flesh and stared at them in astonishment. Then his eyes turned westward to the shadowy outline of the land 
from which he had been torn so cruelly. Yes, Abeli read his thoughts. You can try to escape and flee back to your home, but can you swim that far? He pointed across the forbidding blue expanse of water. And there are sharks to greet you, larger than the greatest crocodiles you have ever seen, with teeth longer and sharper than the point of your arrows. If they do not eat you, then I will catch you and beat you so that you will think the blows of the Arabs were but the timid touch of a young virgin. Then I will chain you again like an animal. Fundi glared at him defiantly, but Abeli went on. Or, if you are wise, you will tell us about the land from which you have come. Then lead us back there without chains, walking ahead of us like a warrior once more, a slayer of great elephants, free and proud. Fundi went on staring at him, but despite himself his expression changed, and his dark eyes widened. Eh, hey, how do you know that I am a slayer of elephants? How do you speak the language of the Lotzi? Why do you offer me my freedom again? Why do you wish to journey to the land of my fathers? All these things I will explain to you, Abeli promised. But for now, think only that we are not your enemies. Here, there is food for you. Fundi was half starved, and he gorged himself on the bowl of rice and goat stew that Abeli placed before him. Gradually, the food in his belly and Abeli's gentle questions lulled him and he answered through a mouthful of half-chewed meat. Abeli translated for Tom. He does not know how far it is, for he does not count distance as we do, but his land is distant, many months of travel. He says he lives beside a great river. It took time for Fundi to tell them all his story, but over the days that followed he filled in the details and intrigued them with his description of lakes, and mighty plains of mountains crowned with shining white like the heads of old men. Snow-capped mountains? Tom was perplexed. Surely it is not possible in these tropical climes. He told them of immense herds of strange beasts, some of them larger than the humpbacked Zebu cattle of the Arabs, black and monstrous, with single-shaped horns that could rip the guts out of black-maned lion with a single thrust. Elephant? Tom asked. Ivory? Fundi's eyes shone when he spoke of the mighty beasts. They are my goats, he boasted to Abeli, and showed him the calluses on his fingers. My name is Fundi, the great slayer of elephants. He held up both his hands with his fingers spread, and ten times closed them into double fists, then flashed them again. This is how many elephants have fallen to my bow, shot through the heart by my arrows, every one of them a mighty bull with teeth longer than this. He stood on tiptoe and stretched his arm up as high as he could reach. "'Are there still many elephant in this land?' Tom asked. "'Or has the mighty hunter, Fundi, killed them all?' When Abeli put the question to him, Fundi laughed, and his face became impish. <laughs> "'Can you count the blades of grass on the great plains? How many fish are there in the lakes? What is the number of duck in the flocks that shade the sky in the season of the big rains?' That is how many elephants there are in the land of Lhotse. Tom's excitement fed upon these intriguing tales, and he lay awake at night in his hard, narrow bunk, dreaming of the wild land the little man described to them. It was not only the promise of wealth and profit. He wanted to see these wonders with his own eyes and pursue the mighty beasts, see the white-capped mountains and voyage on the wide, sweet waters of the lakes. Then the wild flights of his imagination were checked by thoughts of Dorian and Sarah and his commitment to them. Sarah has already promised that she will come with me wherever I travel. She is not like other girls. She is like me. She has adventure in her blood. But what of Dorian? He thought of Dorian as he had not in all the years since they had parted. In his mind's eye he saw him as he had been on that fateful night when he had climbed to the window of his cell on Flor de la Mar, a little helpless child. It took an effort to break his mind out of the rut in which it had travelled so long. What will he be like now? Has he been changed by the hardships he has been forced to suffer? Is he still my little brother, or a different man from the boy I once knew? He wondered, alarmed at the thought of a stranger having taken Dorian's place. One thing I am sure of, he will never have changed as Guy has. 
There will still be the fire in him. He will want to come with me on this new adventure. The bond between us must still be strong. I am certain of it. It seemed as though he had thrown down his gauntlet at the feet of the gods of chance, for the answer he sought came sooner than he had expected. In the dawn light of the following morning, a dirty little bumboat rowed across from the stone quay of the harbour to where the swallow lay at her moorings. When the boatman was still half a pistol shot from the ship's side, he stood on the thwart and hailed them. Effendi, I have a paper for you from the English consul. He held the document aloft and brandished it. Come alongside, Ned Tyler gave him permission. In his cabin, Tom heard the shouts and had a strange premonition that something portentous was about to overtake him. In his shirt sleeves, he hurried up on deck, just in time to snatch the letter out of the boatman's hands. He saw that the address on the folded sheet was in Guy's handwriting. It had changed little since they had practised together under Master Walsh. The missive was addressed to Captain Thomas Courtney aboard the Swallow Zanzibar Roads. When Tom tore it open hurriedly, the message it contained was terse. The Sultan has commanded both of us to an audience at noon this day. I shall meet you at the gate to the fort ten minutes before the hour, G.C. Predictably, Guy was precisely punctual. When he rode up with his sice in attendance, his greeting was cool. He merely nodded, dismounted, and tossed the reins to his servant. Then he glanced in Tom's direction. "'I would not have troubled you, sir,' he said distantly, not meeting Tom's eyes. "'But His Excellency insisted that you be present at this audience.' He drew his watch from the pocket of his waistcoat, glanced at it, then strode in through the gates without looking back. The vizier greeted them with expressions of the greatest respect, bowing and smiling ingratiatingly, and backing away before them into the presence of the Sultan, where he prostrated himself. Guy bowed, but not too low, conscious of his dignity as representative of His Majesty, and offered polite greetings. Tom followed his example. Then his gaze went to the man who sat at the Sultan's right hand. He looked well-fed, and his robe was of the finest quality. The hilt of his dagger was of gold and rhino horn. He was a high-ranking and dignified personage of obvious importance, for even the Sultan deferred to him. He was studying Tom with more than ordinary interest, as though he knew who he was and had heard reports of him. "'I call down the blessings of Allah on you,' the Sultan said, and gestured to the cushions placed ready to receive them. Guy sat awkwardly, finding it difficult to manage his sword while he did so. Tom had spent many hours with the merchants in the markets, and was accustomed to this position. He placed the scabbard of the Neptune sword across his lap. I am honoured to welcome to my court the holy mullah of the mosque of Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik, the brother of the Caliph of Oman. The sultan inclined his head towards the man who sat beside him. Tom stiffened and felt his breathing come faster at the name of the prince, the man who had bought Dorian from the corsair. He stared at the mullah as the sultan went on. This is the holy Al-Alama. He has come from the prince. Both Tom and Guy stared at him. Al-Alama made a graceful gesture. His hands were small and smooth like a girl's. May you find favour in the sight of God and his prophet, he said, and they bowed in acknowledgement. I trust that you have had a pleasant voyage, and when you left your home all was well in your household, Tom said. The mullah replied, I thank you for your concern. The Kaskazi bore us kindly, and Allah smiled upon our enterprise. Al-Alama smiled. I must congratulate you on the excellence of your Arabic. You speak the sacred language as if born to it. The compliments passed back and forth, but Tom found the long, complicated ritual of greetings and well-wishes hard to endure. This man came with news of Dorian. There could be no other reason for this audience. He studied Al-Alama's face, trying to divine the nature of his tidings by the little signs, the twist of his lips, the inflection of his voice, and the expression in his eyes. But the mullah's face was bland, his manner urbane. "'Your trading in the markets of Zanzibar has been profitable?' the mullah asked. "'The prophet approved of the honest merchant?' 
My main reason for visiting the domains of your caliph was not to indulge in trade, Tom told him, relieved to have an opening to address his real concerns. I come on a mission of compassion. I seek a dear one who is lost to me and my family. My lord, the Prince Al-Malik has heard of your quest and has received the petition you have addressed to him, Al-Alama replied. His tone was still expressionless, his face inscrutable. I have heard that your lord is a mighty man, but filled with compassion for the weak, and that he is strong for justice and the law. Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik is all these things. That is the reason why he has sent me in person to deal with your concerns, rather than sending a message that could not express the depth of his feelings for your loss. Tom felt a chill on his skin, even in the closed room and the hot, incense-laden air. The Muller's choice of words was ominous. He felt Guy stir beside him, but he did not look at him. He waited for the Muller to speak again, dreading what he had to say, but Al-Alama sipped delicately at his coffee and looked down at his lamp. At last Tom was forced to press him. I have waited three years to have word of my brother. I beg you not to prolong my suffering. The Muller set down his cup and wiped his lips on the folded cloth that a slave handed him. My Lord Prince bids me speak thus. He paused again as if gathering his thoughts. It is true that some years ago I purchased a young Frankish boy. He was named Al-Amhara for his hair which was a marvellous shade of red. Tom released a long, hissing sigh of relief. They had admitted it. There was to be no denial and subterfuge to battle against. Dorian was in the hands of the Mussulman prince. Your words have lifted a great stone from my soul, a stone that threatened to crush the life out of me, he said, and his voice was choked. He thought he might lose control and break down. Such weakness would be a terrible loss of prestige, and invite the scorn of all those present. He took a deep breath and lifted his chin to meet the Muller's eyes. What terms has your prince set for the return of my brother to the bosom of his family? The Muller did not answer at once, but stroked and smoothed his beard, rearranging the perfumed braids on his chest. My lord ordered me to speak thus. I, Abd Muhammad al-Malik, took the boy Al-Amhara under my protection, paying a princely ransom for him in order to, to protect him from the men who had captured him and to ensure that no further hardship was inflicted upon him. Your prince is a mighty man and merciful, Tom said, but he wanted to shout, Where is he? Where is my brother? What price do you want for his release? My lord, the prince found the boy to be comely and well-favoured. He took him to his heart, and to show his favour and shield him from all evil, he declared Al-Amhara his adopted son. Tom started to rise from the cushion, his face clearly displaying his alarm. His son, he demanded, and foresaw the terrible obstacle that this had placed in his path. Yes, his own son. He treated him like a prince. I was given the task of educating the boy, and I also found him worthy of love. Al-Alama dropped his eyes, and for the first time he showed emotion. "'I rejoice that my brother has found such favour in high places,' Tom said. "'But he is my brother. I have the right of blood. The prophet of God has said that the tie of blood is as steel and cannot be sundered. "'Your knowledge of the holy words of Islam does you credit,' the Mullah said. "'My lord the prince acknowledges your right of blood,' and offers you the payment of blood money for your loss. Al-Alama summoned a servant who came forward carrying a small ebony chest inlaid with ivory and mother-of-pearl. He knelt in front of the two white men, placed the box on the tiles, and opened the lid. Tom had not moved, and now he did not even look down at the contents of the chest, However, Guy leaned forward and stared at the golden coins that filled the box to overflowing. Fifty thousand rupees,' said Al-Alama. "'A thousand of your English pounds. 
some that takes into account that Al-Amkhara was a prince of the royal house of Oman. At last Tom found his voice again and the power of movement. He started up, his hand on the hilt of the Neptune sword. There is not enough gold in Arabia to buy me off, he roared. I came here to find my brother. I shall not leave until he is delivered to me. That is not possible, said Al-Alama, and his voice was low and heavy with regret. Your brother is dead. He died almost two years ago of the malarial fever. There was nothing any man could do to save him, though, Allah knows, we who loved him tried. Al-Amkhara is dead. Tom dropped back on the cushion, his face blanched with shock. His eyes were haunted as he stared at Al-Alama. He did not speak for a long time, and the only sound was the buzzing of a fat blue fly that bumped against the ceiling. I do not believe what you tell me, he whispered. But his voice was hopeless, his expression desolate. I swear to you, as I love God and pray for his salvation, that I have seen Al-Amkhara's name on his tomb in the royal cemetery in Lamu, Al-Alama said, with infinite sorrow in his voice, so that Tom could no longer doubt him. Dorian, he whispered. He was so young, so full of life. Allah is kind. We can be sure that there is a place for him hereafter. My lord, the prince offers you consolation. He shares your sense of loss keenly, the mullah offered. Tom rose to his feet. It seemed to require a great effort to make such a simple movement. I thank your master, he replied. I beg your forbearance, but I must leave you now to be alone to mourn my brother. He turned to the door. Guy stood and bowed to the two Arabs. We thank your lord the prince for his compassion. We accept his offer of blood money. He stooped, closed the lid of the chest and picked it up. All debts between Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik and our family are discharged in full. He followed Tom to the door, hampered by the weight of the chest. Sarah was on her usual perch, high on the walls of the old monastery, from where she could spot Tom as soon as he appeared on the path that led up from the beach. Tom, she called, and waved gaily coming to her feet and running down the crumbled walls with her arms spread wide to balance herself. You were late. I'd been waiting for hours. I'd almost given you up. She jumped down to the ground and raced barefoot down the sandy path. Ten feet from where he stood, she came up short and stared into his face. Tom, what is it? she whispered. She had never seen him like this before. His features were haggard and his eyes filled with a terrible sorrow. Tom! What has happened to you? He took an uncertain step towards her and held out his arms like a drowning man. She flew to him. Tom! Oh, Tom, what is it? She held him with all her strength. Tell me, my darling, I want to help. He began to shake, and she thought he was sick, overcome by some terrible fever. He made a choking sound, and tears streamed down his face. You must tell me, she pleaded. She had never imagined that he could succumb like this. She had always thought him strong and indomitable. But here he was in her arms, broken, devastated. Please, Tom, speak to me. Dorian is dead. She went cold and still. It can't be, she breathed. It just can't be. Are you certain? Is there no doubt? The man who brought the news is a mullah, a holy man. He swore on his faith, Tom said. There can be no doubt. Still holding each other, they sank together to their knees, and she was weeping with him. He was like my own brother, she said, pressing her cheek against his, so that their tears mingled, bathing their faces. After a while, she sniffed and wiped her face on the sleeve of her blouse. How did it happen? He was still unable to speak. Tell me, Tom, she insisted. She knew instinctively that she must make him talk about it. Like a surgeon, she had to lance the boil, let the pus and poison out. At last he began the story, 
the words coming hard, seeming to tear his throat as he forced them out. It took a long time, but at last he had told her everything, and she knew it must be true. "'What are we going to do now?' she asked and stood up. She kept tight hold of his hands and forced him to his feet. She had to stop him giving in to the dark waves of sorrow into which he was sinking. "'I don't know,' he said. "'I know only that Dorian is dead, that I could not save him. "'It was my fault. If only I had come to him sooner.' "'It is not your fault,' she said angrily. "'I will not even let you think that. You did all you could. "'No man could have done more.' "'I don't care any more,' Tom said. "'Yes, you do. You owe it to yourself and to me and the memory of Dorian. "'He always looked up to you.' He knew how strong you were. He would not want this from you. Please don't berate me, Sarah. I am exhausted with grief. Nothing else matters. I will not let you give up. We must plan together, she demanded. What are we going to do now? I don't know, he repeated. But he straightened his shoulders and dashed away the tears. Where are we going, she asked. We cannot stay here, and we can't return to England. Where, Tom? Africa, he said. Abeli has found a man to guide us into the interior. When do we leave? she asked simply, not questioning the decision. Soon. A few days from now. He had steadied himself for the moment, thrown off the debilitating sorrow. It will take that long to refill the water barrels, to buy fresh provisions, and to make the final arrangements. I will be ready, she said. It will be hard. A dangerous journey without end. Are you sure that is what you want? You must tell me now if you have any doubts. Don't be a big booby, Tom Courtney, she said. Of course I'm going with you. When she left the monastery, Sarah took a circuitous route back to the consulate, riding first along the track she had discovered that led to one of the small villages on the seaward side of the island. She had gone only half a mile when she was seized by a certainty that someone was following her. She thought she heard hoofbeats on the track behind her, so she reined in and swivelled in the saddle to look back. The path was hemmed in on both sides by thick vegetation, the twisted stems and glossy leaves of the volutia and clumps of lantana. She could not see further than the last turning in the path, only a few paces behind her. Tom! she called. Is that you? And there was no reply. And in the silence she decided that she was starting at ghosts and shadows. You're being foolish, she told herself firmly, and rode on. When she reached the village, she bought a basket of vegetables from one of the old women there, her excuse for her long absence, then rode almost to the port so that she could return to the consulate along the main road. She had much to occupy her thoughts, her mood swung from excited elation at the prospect of the adventure ahead of her to deep sadness when she faced the necessity of leaving Caroline and little Christopher. She loved them both dearly. Caroline had come to rely on her strength and fortitude in the dark unhappiness of her marriage to Guy, and Sarah looked upon baby Christopher as though he were her own. She worried how they'd fare without her. Could they not come with us, she wondered, and almost immediately knew that she was silly even to think it. I have to leave them, she steeled herself. I love them both, but Tom is my man, and I love him more than life itself. I must go with him. She was so preoccupied with these thoughts that she rode into the stable yard without noticing Guy until he called to her sternly from the shade of the long veranda. Where have you been, Sarah? She looked up in confusion. Oh, you startled me, Guy. Guilty conscience, he accused. I've been buying vegetables. She touched the basket tied to the back of her saddle. I am about to elope with a cabbage, she laughed merrily. But Guy did not smile. Come to my office, he ordered. And she noticed his sice hovering in the doorway of the stable. The boy was Guy's creature, a sly, pockmarked little fellow, his name was Assam. She had never liked or trusted him, and even less so now that she saw his grin was knowing and gloating. With a sinking feeling, Sarah wished she had taken more care to cover her tracks when she went to her assignation with Tom. 
and that she had given more weight to her feeling that she had been followed that afternoon. I wish to bathe and change for dinner, she told Guy, trying to brazen it out, but he scowled and slapped his riding crop against his boot. This will not take long, he said. As your guardian, I must insist that you obey me. Assam will take your mare. With resignation, she followed him down the veranda and into the cool gloom of his office. He closed the doors behind them and left her standing in the centre of the floor as he took his seat behind his desk. You have been meeting him at the old monastery, he said flatly. Who? What are you talking about? Do not bother to deny it, he said. On my instructions, as Sam followed you. You have been spying on me, she flared at him. How dare you? She tried to whip up her indignation, but it was not convincing. I am pleased that you do not insult my intelligence by denying it. Why should I deny the man I love? She drew herself up, tall and truly angry now. You have made yourself into a sailor's whore, he said. Once he has had all he wants from between your legs, he will laugh and sail away, the way he did with your sister. When he sails away, I will go with him. I am your guardian, and you are only eighteen. You will go nowhere without my consent. I am going with Tom, she said, and nothing you can say or do will stop me. We will see about that, he stood up. You are confined to your rooms, and you will not leave them again until after the swallow has sailed from Zanzibar. You cannot treat me like a prisoner. Yes, I can. There will be a guard at the door of your quarters and others at the gates. I have given them their orders. Now go to your room. I will have your dinner sent up to you. Tom was so occupied with readying the swallow for sea that he paid scant attention to the square-rigged ship that limped into the harbour after sunset. Even in the poor light he saw that she had been damaged by storms. It was the season when the cyclones swept down the Indian Ocean, and she must have encountered one of these devil winds. The name on her transom was the Apostle. She flew the tattered flag of the East India Company at her masthead, and once she had anchored, Tom sent Luke Jarvis across in the longboat to ask for the news. Luke returned within the hour and came to Tom's cabin, where he was writing up the ship's log. She is uh, outward bound from Bombay with mixed cargo of cloth and tea, Luke reported. She ran into a storm north of the Mascarines. She intends to make her repairs here before resuming her voyage. What news? Oh, most of it is stale, for the Apostle sailed from the company dark months ago, but the war against the French is going well. William is whipping their backsides. He is a good fighter, our Willie. Great news, Tom jumped up. Tell the crew and issue a good tot to every man to drink King Willie's health. What Tom could not know was that apart from the news of the war, the Apostle carried a packet of letters and documents sealed in a tarred canvas bag from the Governor of Bombay and addressed to His Majesty's Consul at Zanzibar. The Captain sent the packet ashore the following morning, and Guy Courtney opened it at the luncheon table on the long veranda of the consulate. Caroline sat opposite him, but Sarah was still locked in her own quarters. There is a personal letter from your father, Guy told Caroline as he picked it out of the assortment of gazettes and sealed papers. It is addressed to me, Caroline protested, as he broke the wax seal and began to read it. I am your husband, he said complacently. Suddenly his expression changed and the sheet shook in his hands. My God, this passes all belief. What is it? Caroline laid down the silver spoon in her hand must be momentous news indeed to have that effect on her husband. Guy prided himself on his cool composure in even the most trying circumstances. He was staring at the letter, and slowly his expression changed from consternation to jubilation. I have him now. Who? What has happened? Tom. He is a murderer. By God, now he will pay the price on the gallows. He has murdered our dear brother William and there is a warrant out for his arrest. I intend to do my duty, and it will give me the greatest pleasure to cut him down to size. 
Guy leapt to his feet, knocking the teapot off its stand. It shattered on the tiles, but he scarcely glanced at it. Where are you going, Guy? Caroline stood up, her face white with shock, swaying on her feet. To the Sultan, he said, and shouted to the servants. Tell us, Sam, to saddle the grey and to hurry. He turned back to Caroline and punched his fist into the palm of his other hand. At last! I've waited for this for so long. I'll ask the Sultan for men from his guard. After the trouble Tom has caused him, he won't quibble. We will arrest Master Thomas and seize the swallow. When we sell the ship, she should bring in two thousand pounds at the very least. I deserve a reward for bringing a dangerous criminal to justice. He laughed triumphantly. Ha <laughs> ha! Master Tom will have a free berth on the Apostle back to London in chains. Guy, he is your brother. You cannot do this to him. Caroline was distraught. Billy was Tom's brother also, yet the swine ran him through in cold blood. Now he will pay a high price for all his arrogance. She ran to him and clutched at his sleeve. No, Guy, you cannot do this. So, he rounded on her, his face darkening and seeming to swell with rage. You plead for him. You still love him, don't you? In a minute you would pull up your skirts and open your legs for him like the dirty little slut you are. That's not true. You would love him to plant another bastard in your belly. He struck her across the face, sending her reeling back against the low wall of the veranda. Well, your lover is going to make no more bastards. He strode away down the terrace, bellowing for his horse. Caroline leaned heavily against the wall, clutching the angry red wheel on her cheek, until she heard his horse gallop away through the gates and down the track towards the harbour and the fort. Then she dragged herself to her feet. When Guy had first told her of the liaison between Tom and her young sister, she had been horrified and torn with jealousy. Then, last night, she had gone to Sarah's room and spent nearly two hours with her. Slowly she had come to realise how deeply her sister was in love. She had long been aware that her own feelings for Tom were hopeless, so she had thrust them aside, and though the pain of the sacrifice was intense, she had kissed Sarah and promised to help her and Tom to elope. I have to warn them, she whispered aloud, but there is so little time. She picked up a tray from the sideboard, loaded it with a plate of food for Sarah, and carried it down the veranda, past the nursery, where Christopher was sleeping, to the last door. One of Guy's watchmen was squatting there, half asleep in the drowsy afternoon heat, with his musket across his lap. He started awake as she came towards him, then scrambled to his feet. Salam alaikum, Donna, he bowed. The master has given strict orders that no one should pass this door, coming or going. I have food for the lady, my sister, she said imperiously. Stand aside. He hesitated. His orders had not covered this eventuality. Then he bowed again. I am dust under your feet, he said drew the big iron key from the folds of his robe and turned it in the lock. Caroline swept past him, but as the door closed, she dropped the tray on the first table and ran through to Sarah's bedchamber. Sarah, where are you? Her sister lay on the bed under the tent-like mosquito net. A light sheet covered her, and she seemed to be sleeping. But as soon as she heard Caroline's voice, she threw it back and sprang from the bed, fully clothed and wearing riding boots under her long skirts. Caroline... I'm so glad you've come. I did not want to leave without saying goodbye to you. Caroline stared at her, and Sarah ran to her and embraced her. I am leaving with Tom. He is waiting for me on the beach below the old monastery, but I am late already. How will you escape past Guy's guards? Caroline asked. Sarah reached under her skirts and drew out the dueling pistols. I will shoot anyone who tries to stop me. Listen to me, Sarah. A letter has come from father in Bombay. Tom is accused of the murder of his elder brother, and there is a warrant issued for his arrest. I know that. Tom told me. She pulled away. You cannot stop me, Caroline. It makes no difference. I know he is innocent, and I am going away with him. You don't understand. Caroline seized her arm again. I have already promised that I will help you and Tom. I am not going back on my word. I came to tell you that Guy has ridden to the fort to inform the Sultan. They are going to arrest Tom and send him back to England in chains to his trial and execution. No, 
Sarah stared at her sister. You have to warn him, but you will not escape unless I help you, she thought quickly. This is what we'll do. She spoke rapidly, filling out the plan as she went along. Do you understand? she asked when she had finished. Sarah nodded. I am ready. I have made all my preparations. But hurry, Caroline. Tom will believe I am not coming. He will tire of waiting and leave. Caroline went to the door and called to the guard to open up. When she left, he locked the door behind her. Caroline went directly to the stables and shouted for Assam. Saddle my mare. When the groom hesitated, she stamped her foot. At once, or I will have you beaten, she snapped. I am in haste. I have promised to meet the master at the fort. Within minutes, Assam brought out the horse, and Caroline took the reins from him. Go to the gates and tell the guards to open up. I am coming out. Thoroughly intimidated by now, Assam ran to obey. Trying not to hurry or show her agitation, Caroline led the saddled mare across the lawns to the end of the veranda. The guard at Sarah's door stood to greet her, and she proffered the letter from her father. Give this to my sister immediately, she ordered. He slung the musket over his shoulder and took the letter from her. He went to the door and knocked upon it. After a moment, Sarah called from within. What is it? A letter, Donna. Give it to me. He unlocked the door and swung it open. Sarah stepped out and thrust the pair of pistols into his startled face. The hammers were cocked and her fingers were curled around the triggers. Lie down on your face, she ordered. But instead of obeying, the guard snatched the musket from his shoulder and tried to cock the hammer. Calmly, Sarah lowered the aim of the pistol in her right hand and at point-blank range shot him in the knee. He squealed and collapsed on the tiles of the veranda. The shattered leg twisted under him. Sarah kicked away the fallen musket. Fool! You should have done as I ordered, she told him harshly. The next ball will be in your head. She touched the muzzle of the other pistol to his forehead. He covered his face and cowered at her feet, and Sarah thrust the fired pistol into her belt, then stepped back into the doorway. She picked up the leather bag into which she had packed her most treasured possessions and dragged it out onto the veranda. In the meantime, Caroline had run forward to help her hoist the bag onto the saddle. Then the two sisters embraced swiftly but passionately. Go with God, my darling Sarah. I wish you and Tom all joy of each other. I know that you love him also, Caroline. Yes, but he is yours now. Treat him kindly. Kiss Christopher for me. We will both miss you, but go now, hurry. Caroline made a step for her with her linked hands and boosted Sarah up into the saddle. Goodbye, my sister, she called as Sarah urged the mare into a gallop and sped away across the lawns. Assam saw her coming and shouted to the other guards to close the gates. But Sarah rode straight at him, and he had to throw himself aside to avoid being knocked down by the driving hoofs. The mare flew through the open gates and out into the forest. Sarah turned her onto the path that led southwards through the palm groves to the ruined monastery. Please wait, Tom, she whispered, and the wind flung away the words and sent her long hair streaming out behind her like a flag. Please wait for me, my darling, I am coming. She pushed the mare to the top of her speed, and the boles of the palm trees streamed past her in a blur. At the gates of the monastery she pulled the mare down from full gallop to a plunging halt. The animal fidgeted and threw her head, sweating nervously, unaccustomed to such rough treatment. Tom! Sarah screamed, and the echoes from the ancient walls mocked her. Tom! He has gone, she thought. While the mare backed and circled under her, she leaned out of the saddle and searched the soft ground. She picked out Tom's fresh footprints coming up from the beach and the trampled area in front of the gateway where he had paced back and forth waiting for her. Then, his patience clearly exhausted, the string of his footprints headed back towards the beach. "'Tom!' she shouted in despair and put the mare at the narrow track through the undergrowth. The branches whipped against her legs as they raced down beside the stream and at last burst out onto the white coral sands with the limpid water of the lagoon in front of her. She saw the mark that the keel of the felucca had left at the water's edge. 
and then she looked up and saw the tiny craft. It was moving slowly towards the gap in the reef half a mile away. Tom was in the stern with the long bamboo pole in his hands, punting her over the shallow flats. Tom! she screamed and waved. Tom! But the wind fretted in the palms, and the surf boomed and boiled on the outer reef, smothering her cries. The tiny felucca moved away doggedly, and Tom did not look back. She urged the mare into the water, and though at first she balked, she was a game little horse, and she plunged forward, leaping and lunging through the deeper holes, until the water reached halfway up to her shoulders, and Sarah's boots and skirts were soaked. But the felucca was moving faster, drawing away from them. Tom! Sarah called in agony. Then she pulled the second pistol from her belt, pointed it at the sky and fired. The report was an insignificant pop in the immensity of sea and wind. He has not heard. It took a long second for the sound to carry. Then she saw Tom's distant figure start, and he looked back at her. Oh, praise God, she almost wept with relief. With an expert thrust of the pole, Tom spun the felucca about and sent it gliding back across the lagoon. Where were you? What has happened? he shouted across as he came within hail. Guy has found out about you and William, she called back. He has gone to the fort to raise the guard. They are going to seize you and your ship. She saw his expression harden. But he said nothing as he brought the boat alongside the mare. Then he threw down the punt pole, reached across to seize her around the waist and lift her from the saddle. He set her down on the deck. My bag, she panted. He pulled the dirk from the sheath on his belt and cut the thong that tied it to the pommel. He dragged it on board, slapped the mare, and she turned and floundered back towards the beach. Tom grabbed the bamboo pole and aimed the bows of the felucca at the pass once more. How long ago did Guy go to the fort? he asked. How much time do we have? Not much. He left the consulate well over two hours ago. Stand by the halyard, he ordered grimly. We'll have to hoist the sail and take a chance on the coral. The lateen sail flapped and snapped, then filled with the monsoon wind. The felucca heeled sharply and raced towards the gap in the reef. She skimmed through, and as soon as the water turned blue under her keel, Tom stood at the tiller and brought her round on a heading for the harbour where the swallow lay at anchor. Tell me everything, he ordered. She came to him and put her arms around his waist. How did Guy find out? A ship came in last night. <gasps> the Apostle, he exclaimed. I should have expected this. He listened intently as she related all the details. When she had finished, he murmured, God grant we are in time, and looked ahead as the harbour of Zanzibar opened before them, and he saw the little swallow lying tranquilly at her anchor. Thank God they have not seized her yet, he said fervently. But at that moment they both saw the flotilla of a dozen small boats that had left the stone quay below the fort and were streaming across the bay towards the ship. Tom shaded his eyes and stared across the mile of water that separated them from the leading boat. He recognised the tall, lean figure in the plumed hat in the bows. Guy is keen as a hound with the smell of the fox hot in his nostrils. The barge was riding low in the water under the weight of the armed men crowded into it. All the other craft of the flotilla were similarly laden. He has a hundred of the Sultan's rascals with him at least, Tom calculated. He is taking no chances. He glanced up at the masthead and judged the strength and direction of the wind on his cheek. He had sailed the craft enough by now to know all her foibles well, and how to squeeze every foot of speed out of her. Harden her up a little, he called to Sarah, who ran forward to the boom sheet. The felucca liked her touch and surged forward under their feet. It will be a near-run thing, Tom eyed the leading boat, and calculated the difference in speed and course. They had the advantage of the wind on a broad reach. Guy was close-hauled, making heavy weather of it with his overloaded howl deep in the water. Tom doubted that the other boat could reach the anchored swallow on a single tack. On the other hand, the felucca must cut right across the bows of Guy's dhow. Tom narrowed his eyes as he judged the converging course. 
We are going to pass within easy musket shot of the leading boat, he told Sarah. Pile those nets and fish boxes along the starboard rail and lie flat behind them. What about you? she asked anxiously. Didn't I tell you? I'm immune to musket balls, he grinned. And besides, all Arabs are poor shots. If she had not loved him so much, she might have been more impressed by his disregard of danger. My place is at your side, she said stubbornly, trying to match his show of courage. Your place is where I say it is. His expression became bleak and cold. Get down, woman. She had never seen him like this before, and it took her off balance. She found herself obeying meekly, and only when she was lying flat on the smelly deck, protected by the nets and heavy wooden boxes, did she begin to recover her sense of independence. I must not let him get the upper hand so soon, she warned herself. But her thoughts were interrupted by a faint shout. The Arabs in the leading dhow had spotted the little felucca racing across their quarter. The vessel heeled dangerously as they crowded to the rail to stare across the gap, jabbering and gesticulating, cocking and brandishing their long-barreled jezels. Stop! Guy's voice was faint on the wind. But they were close enough now for Tom to see clearly his dark, furious expression. Heave to at once, Tom Courtney, or I will order my men to fire upon you. Tom laughed and waved cheerily. Piss into the wind, dear brother, and get it all back into your face. They were less than a hundred yards apart, a pistol shot, and Guy called to the Arab musketeers who crammed the open deck of the dhow, and with his drawn sword pointed across at the felucca. In response, they levelled their muskets, and despite his braggadocio, Tom felt a qualm of fear as he looked into the line of weapons aimed across the gap at him. "'Fire!' Guy yelled with a sweep of his sword. There was a blast and a bank of thick white powder smoke briefly obscured the dow. The air around Tom's head was filled with the whir and buzz of passing shot. The heavy lead balls kicked spurts of spray from the surface of the water all around the howl of the felucca and thudded into her side, knocking white splinters from her timbers. Tom felt something pluck at the sleeve of his shirt, and when he glanced down there was a tear in the cloth and a thin trickle of blood from the shallow wound across his biceps. "'Are you all right, Tom?' Sarah asked anxiously from where she lay at his feet. He laughed again and turned half away so she could not see the blood on his sleeve. "'I told you they were poor shots!' He lifted his hat and with it gave Guy a mocking salute. But at the movement a few drops of scarlet splattered the dirty deck at his feet. Sarah saw the blood and her face blanched. Then, without hesitation, she sprang to her feet and rushed back to the stern. "'Get back!' Tom snapped. "'Those are real musket balls. You could be killed!' Sarah ignored him, and placed herself four square in front of him, shielding him with her own body. She threw back the shawl from her shoulders and shook out her hair so that it flew out like a banner on the wind. "'Shoot!' she screamed across at the barge. "'Shoot me if you dare, Guy Courtney!' They were close enough to see the frustration and fury on Guy's face. "'Get down, Sarah!' he yelled at her. "'If you are hit, it will be your own doing.' Tom tried to push her down on the deck, but she flung both arms around his neck and clung to him. Her face was bright with fury as she glared across at the barge. "'If you want your brother, you will have to kill me first. she shrieked at Guy. Guy's expression changed from triumph to uncertainty. He looked back at his men. The musketeers were reloading frantically. Tom saw the tips of their ramrods pumping up and down as they drove fresh balls down the long barrels. It took even a good man fully two minutes to reload, and by the time the next volley was ready, the two craft were as close as they would ever be as the felucca crossed the bows of the barge. The quicker and more expert of the musketeers finished loading and priming. Four of them cocked and raised their jezels in unison, sighting over the long barrels at the pair in the stern of the felucca. Still, Guy hesitated. But then his grim expression crumbled, and with a sweep of his sword blade, he knocked up the weapon of the man beside him and shouted in Arabic, Stop! Do not fire! You will hit the woman! One man ignored the order and fired. There was a spurt of blue smoke from the muzzle of his jezel, and the ball thudded into the tiller bar in Tom's hand. 
Stop! Guy yelled in fury and slashed the sword down on the man's wrist. There was a flash of bright blood and the man clutched his injured arm and staggered away across the deck. Stop! Guy turned on the other men and reluctantly, one at a time, they lowered their muskets. The felucca head reached on the barge, then drew away from her. You haven't won yet, Tom Courtney, Guy shouted after them. From now on, every man's hand is against you. One of these days you will pay what you owe in full. I will see to that, I swear it. Tom ignored his brother's fading shouts of anger and looked forward. The swallow was now lying only a cable's length ahead, but the musket fire from the barge had alerted her crew. They were swarming over her deck and climbing into her rigging. Ned Tyler was not waiting for orders to get the ship under way. Sarah hugged Tom around the waist and looked back at the swarm of small boats that ploughed along behind them. That was exciting, she said, and her eyes were sparkling. Don't you dare look so pleased with yourself, you little hussy, Tom hugged her. You disobeyed my direct orders. You had best accustom yourself to that, she grinned up at him, for it may happen again some day. Then she became businesslike, and with his dagger she cut the torn sleeve from his shirt. She used the cloth to bind up the flesh wound in his arm and staunch the bleeding. In the meantime they were coming up fast on the swallow, and Tom told her, Belay that, and get ready to jump sharply. The capstan was clanking on the foredeck of the sloop, as Ned Tyler hauled his anchor, and as the flukes pulled free of the bottom, the sloop paid off and began making sternway. Sarah pulled up her skirts and tucked them into her belt, so that her legs were bare and free, and crouched by the rail. Tom saw Aberley's head at the rail above him. As the hulls touched and Tom dropped the sail, Aberley jumped down like a great black panther, ambushing a gazelle from the branch of a tree. His bare feet thudded on the deck as he landed beside Sarah. He swept her up in his arms. She shrieked in protest but in the same movement he sprang back, caught hold of the boarding ladder that dangled over the sloop's side, and carried her up onto the swallow's deck. Tom snatched up Sarah's leather bag from where it lay on the deck of the felucca and jumped across the narrow gap of water that separated the hulls, allowing the felucca to drift free, and he followed Ubberly up. As he swung one leg over the rail, Ned Tyler saluted him solemnly from the helm. "'Welcome aboard, Captain,' he said. "'Thank you, Mr. Tyler.' I can think of no reason why we should linger here any longer. Get the ship on the wind, if you please. He dropped Sarah's bag on the deck and strode to the stern. As the swallow came round, the dhow, with Guy in her bows, was two hundred yards dead astern, but the sloop drew away from it so swiftly that it seemed to be at anchor. Guy's bare sword hung at his side, his shoulders were slumped dejectedly, and his face was contorted with frustration and hatred. When they saw Tom, the men around him could no longer restrain themselves, and they opened a furious fusillade, banging away with their muskets. But Guy seemed oblivious to them. All his attention was concentrated on his twin brother. They stared at each other as the two vessels drew swiftly apart. Sarah came to stand beside Tom. Hand in hand, they watched the shape of the barge dwindle until they could no longer make out Guy's tall figure. Then the swallow rounded the point, and the harbour of Zanzibar closed behind them, and the dhow was lost to sight. Dorian Courtney stood up. He'd been on his knees praying to the god of his fathers. He wandered along the edge of the cliff, then stooped to pick up a pebble that had caught his eye. He wet it with his tongue, then held it to the sunlight. It was pink agate, striated with soft blue layers, and crowned with crystals of diamond clarity. It was beautiful. He leaned out and let it drop from his fingers, then watched it fall five hundred sheer feet down the cliffs. It dwindled in size and disappeared before it hit the surface of the sea far below. It left neither splash nor ripple upon the surface. No sign of anything so lovely ever having existed. Suddenly, for the first time in almost seven years, he thought of little Yasmini, who had vanished from his life in the same way. The wind tugged 
and his robe streamed out behind him, that his feet were planted wide, and he felt no fear of the drop that opened at his feet. At his right hand, the gaunt red rock cliff that stood so tall above the sea was riven by a narrow valley. In its depths, clinging precariously to the shore, were the palm groves, roofs and white domes of the village of Shiri. Dorian's men were encamped among the low acacia thorn trees and palms further up the valley. The blue smoke of their campfires rose in oily tendrils straight into the air until it caught the eddy of the wind over the summit of the cliffs and streamed away towards the forbidding hills and dunes of the desert. Dorian shaded his eyes and looked out to sea. The ships were closer now. Four stately dows with high poops and matting sails, the flotilla of Prince Al-Malik. They had been in sight since dawn, but the wind was against them, forcing them to tack and tack again. Dorian narrowed his eyes, judging their progress, and he saw that it would be many hours still before they could enter the bay and anchor off the beach. He was impatient and restless. It was so long since last he had seen the prince, his adoptive father. He turned away from the edge of the cliff and started back along the path that led to the ancient tomb. It stood on the crest of this rocky promontory, its dome bleached by the desert suns of a hundred years. Al-Ailama and the sheikhs of the Saar were still at prayer. Their rugs spread in the shadow of the tomb, turned in the direction of the holy city that lay hundreds of miles to the north across this burning land. Dorian slowed his pace, not wishing to arrive while they were still at their devotions. The Tsar did not know that he was not of Islam. On the instruction of the prince, he had concealed that from them during all the time he had lived among them. He knew that they would never have taken him so readily into the tribe if they had guessed the truth, that he was an infidel. They believed that he was under a vow of penance not to pray in the community of believers, but to make his devotions to Allah in solitude. At the hour of prayer, he would always leave them and wander away into the desert. Alone, he prayed to the God of his fathers, kneeling in the wilderness. But the words were becoming more difficult as time passed, and his devotions more perfunctory. Gradually, the strange sense of having been deserted by his own God was overcoming him. He was losing his childhood faith, and he felt bewildered and bereft. He stopped on the crest of the hill and watched the men kneeling and prostrating themselves in the shade of the mosque. Not for the first time he envied them their immutable faith. He waited at a distance until they had finished and began to disperse. Most mounted up and trotted down the cliff path to the village below. Soon there were only two men left near the tomb. Batula, his lance-bearer, was with the two camels, squatting with infinite patience in the patch of shade the animals threw. The bronze war shield was tied to the saddle of Dorian's riding camel, and in the leather boot were his jezel and long lance, its point bright in the sun and the green pennant fluttering. These were all the accoutrements of the desert warrior. Al-Alama was also waiting for him, seated out of the wind on an outcrop of red rock. Dorian turned towards him and strode up the path. The first streaks of grey now showed in the mullah's beard, but his skin was still unlined, and despite the months of hard riding and lean rations, his girth had not shrunk. He inclined his head to one side as he watched Al-Salil, the drawn sword, come towards him. Al-Salil was tall now, and under the long swirling robes he was lean and hard, his flesh pared down and tempered by the desert. He came on with a swinging gait, like the pace of a racing camel, and there was an air of authority and command in the set of his shoulders and the carriage of his veiled head. His name was well chosen, Al-Alama murmured to himself. When Dorian reached him, he made a sign of invitation, and the young man dropped down beside him on the rock. His legs curled under him. He sat like one of the Tsar, gracefully at ease, the curved sword in its silver and leather scabbard across his knees. Only Dorian's eyes were visible, the rest of his face was covered by the tail of his headdress, which was wound loosely over his nose, mouth and chin. The eyes were piercing green and bright, and despite the desert sand and glare, they were not shot with blood. Slowly Dorian unwound the cloth that covered his face and smiled at the mullah. It is good to have you back, 
I have missed you, Holy Father, he said. Nobody to argue with. My life has been dull indeed. Dull? <laughs> Al-Alama hid a smile. It is not what the sheikhs have told me of your stay with them. Sixteen of the enemy to your own lance. Dorian stroked his beard, which sprang into curls under his fingers, crackling in the dry desert air, bright as newly forged copper. The Ottoman are easy to kill, he said deprecatingly. But the smile remained on his lips. He is still as winsome as the child I first met on the island of Dar el Shaitan. Al Alama studied his face. The high, thoughtful forehead of the scholar, offset by the hard line of mouth and jaw that bespoke the warrior and the leader of men. Why have you brought me here, old father? Dorian asked, leaning forward to look into his face. You always have a reason for what you do. Al Alama smiled and softly asked a question in reply. Do you know whose tomb this is? Dorian glanced up at the weathered dome and crumbling walls. That of a holy man, he said. There were many such ancient tombs, some guarding the scattered oases of the interior, others on the cliffs and rugged hills along the Omani coast of southern Arabia. Yes, Al Alama agreed. A holy man? I cannot read the name, Dorian said, for most of the inscriptions on the wall had been abraded by the sand-laden winds. There were many, some quotations from the Quran, but others Dorian did not recognize. Perhaps they were the words of the dead man himself. Al Alama rose to his feet and circled the tomb, pausing to read any of the inscriptions that were still legible. After a moment, Dorian stood up and followed him. There is a quotation from the saint who lies within. Perhaps it is of interest to you, Al Alama pointed high up on the wall. Dorian deciphered some of it with difficulty. The orphan who comes from the sea, he read aloud, and Alama nodded encouragement. With the tongue and the crown of the prophet. Dorian stopped. I cannot read the next line. It is too faded. With the tongue and the crown of the prophet, but with darkness in a pagan heart, Al Alama helped him. Dorian went closer to the wall, peering up at it. When the light fills the pagan heart, he will bring together the sands of the desert that are divided, and his just and pious father shall ride upon the back of the elephant. Dorian came back to Al Alama's side. What is it? I do not recognize it from the Quran. As a poem, it rhymes neatly, but it makes no sense, he said. What are the tongue and crown of the prophet? How could an orphan have a father? Why the back of an elephant? The prophet was crowned with red hair, and of course his tongue was Arabic, the sacred language, Al Alama pointed out, and stood up. In the palace of Muscat stands the elephant throne of Oman, carved from mighty tusks of ivory. I will leave you to consider the rest of the prophecy. If he applies himself to it, even such a dull student as Al Salil should be able to find a solution to the riddle of the holy time time. Time time, Dorian exclaimed. This is the tomb of the saint? He stared at the eroded inscription. And now the saint's name appeared like a figure seen through a dark mist. This is the prophecy. These are the words that have shaped my life. He felt a sense of awe, but it was mingled with anger and resentment that he had been deprived of so much and been made to suffer for these few mystic words written so long ago and now only barely legible. He wanted to challenge them, to protest and to refute them. But Alama was halfway down the path into the valley, leaving him in this desolate place to confront his destiny. Dorian remained there for many hours. Sometimes he paced angrily along the walls of the tomb, searching the other inscriptions for any further fragments of knowledge. He read them aloud, testing the sound of the words rather than the sense, trying to divine the hidden meanings that lay behind them. Sometimes he squatted and studied a single word or phrase. Then he sprang to his feet again and returned to the inscription that al Alama had pointed out to him. If I am indeed the orphan you speak of... 
Then you are wrong, old man. It can never come to pass. I am a Christian. I will never accept Islam. He defied the ancient saint. I shall never bring together the sands of the desert, whatever your meaning there. Lord! Batula's voice broke into his meditation, and Dorian stood up. The ships! Batula gestured down the cliffs. They are entering the bay. Batula had the camels up and moving towards the head of the path. Dorian broke into a run, catching them easily before they started down. He called to his own beast as he came loping up alongside her. Ibrisam! Silk wind! At the sound of his voice she turned her head and looked down at him with those great dark eyes with their heavy double fringe of lashes and roared softly, lovingly, to welcome him. She was a noble, full-pointed Sherari. He swung up into the high saddle seven feet above the ground with a single effortless movement. He touched her neck with the tip of the long riding wand and shifted his weight forward into the saddle, which was cushioned with the finest nedged leather and hung with luxurious trappings, tassels and straps dyed with shades of red, yellow and blue, woven carrying nets embroidered with silver stars and metal tissue. Ibrisam responded to his touch and movement, stretching into that elegant, comfortable gait that once had carried her beloved master at ten miles every hour for eighteen hours without check from the tongue of Wadi Taub across the grisly plain of Madkhair, strewn with the white bones of lost caravans to the brackish waters of the oasis of Mashadid. She loved Dorian like a faithful dog. After a full day's journey through the terrible places of the sands, she would not sleep in the desert night unless he lay down beside her. No matter how fierce her thirst or hunger, she would break off from drinking or grazing to come to him and nuzzle him, begging for his caress and the comfort of his voice. They flew down the path, overtaking Batula before he reached the floor of the valley. The entire encampment was in turmoil, camels roaring, men shouting and ululating, firing joy shots into the air as they poured down through the groves towards the beach. Ibrisam carried Dorian to the head of this wild procession and across the golden sands to the water's edge. When Prince Al-Malik stepped ashore, Dorian was the first to run forward to greet him. His face was unveiled and he fell to his knees and kissed the hem of the prince's robe. May all your days be golden with glory, Lord. Too long my eyes have hungered for sight of your face. The prince lifted him to his feet and gazed into his face. Al-Salil, I would not have known you, but for the colour of your hair, my son. He embraced Dorian, holding him to his breast. I can see that all the reports I have had of you are true. You have become a man indeed. Then the prince turned to greet the sheikhs of the Tsar, as they also pressed forward and surrounded him. When he had embraced them, the prince moved slowly up the valley in a triumphal procession. The desert warriors strewed palm fronds at his feet, called blessings upon him, kissed the hem of his robe and fired their jezels in the air. A leather tent, large enough to cover a hundred men, had been set up beside the well in the shade of the grove. The sides were open to allow the evening breeze off the sea to waft through, and rugs and cushions covered the sandy earth. The prince took his seat in the centre of the floor, and the sheikhs gathered around him. Slaves brought pitchers of well water for them to wash their hands. Then they presented huge bronze platters of food, piled high with yellow rice swimming in melted camel milk butter, and fragrant stews of mutton and spices. Al-Malik took a morsel from each dish delicately in his right hand. Some he tasted himself, other titbits he fed to the men around him. This was an honour he was bestowing, a mark of his favour. These hard-bitten, hawkish warriors who could not count the war wounds that scarred their faces and bodies, treated him with the respect and affection of loving children for their father. When they had eaten, the prince gestured for the still-brimming platters to be taken out to the ranks of common warriors who squatted in the open that they might share the banquet. The red sun wheeled down behind the hills, and the stars pricked through the darkening desert sky. They washed their hands again and the slaves lit the hookahs. 
The sides of the leather tent were lowered. The sheikhs clustered closer around the prince and passed the ivory mouthpieces from hand to hand. The thick, curling clouds of Turkish tobacco smoke billowed around their heads. In the yellow light of the lamps, they began to talk. The first to speak said, The port has sent an army of 15,000 men to take Moscat. Yakub has opened the gates of the city to them. The sublime port was the might and authority of the Turkish Ottoman Empire, its seat in distant Istanbul. Al Malik's elder brother, Al Uza ibn Yakub, the weak and dissolute caliph of Oman in Muscat, had at last capitulated to the Ottomans without offering battle. Allah alone knew what bribes and assurances he had received, but he had welcomed the occupying army of the port into his city, and now the freedom and independence of all the desert tribes was in the most terrible jeopardy. 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 Terrible jeopardy.